training day. My name is Neil Peacock. I'm with the Office of Environmental Compliance and Outreach in the Division of Local Assistance. I'm going to be serving as your moderator today. Um, so we're ex excited to have so many of our local agency partners and district team members in this effort uh, to clarify many of our key policies, processes, and procedures, and ultimately to help make it easier for all of us to deliver local assistance projects. Uh, with us today, <clears throat> we have staff from RTPAs, MPOs, cities, counties, Caltrans from across the state, engineers, planners, management analysts, fund administrators, and many others that focus on virtually every function involved in the local assistance process, from programming, monitoring, and accounting, to project delivery, environmental compliance, construction oversight, and contracting. In fact, we've had so many people want to join us today, <clears throat> and we had to switch from the Zoom's training platform to its webinar function in order to accommodate the unprecedented, unprecedented demand that we've received. We have almost 600 participants um, scheduled to join us today and want to do our best at both answering your questions and managing our time. So as Sherry mentioned, we're asking everyone to use the Q&A function in Zoom to share your questions with us so that they can be answered by our subject area experts in real time. Um, please also feel free to use the chat function to share your observations or even any local or regional agency best practice examples that you'd like to share. Um, everyone will be muted, as again, as Sherry mentioned, um, due to our time constraints, we will not be having open Q&A. So those features will be particularly important for you to use as we go so you can get your question logged and you can get your question answered. Okay, again, in real time as we go, please use those features. Okay, um, our training partners at Sac State, Sherry and Tracy will be um, at the, the College of Continuing Education will monitor both the chat and the Q&A windows to help keep our responses organized and to ensure we get you the answers needed. <clears throat> We're also gonna be copying the Q&A in the chat as well as resources and links put into the chat. Um, we're gonna be recording today's session so we can post all of this um, in bite-sized pieces for everyone's future reference, okay? And a, a final housekeeping note here, um, we will be sharing contact information with our various program managers at headquarters and the districts. So you can follow up with more questions for your specific projects as needed. Um, can't emphasize enough the importance of one-on-one -on -one relationships between our local agency partners and our Caltrans counterparts to help respond to those critical path questions that you might have and ensure a seamless process for the delivery of your local project, okay? Now, with that, let's take a quick look at our agenda um, before we turn it over to Don and to Dee for their leadership message. So, you know, we sent out a survey and in response to the input that we gathered when we were first planning today's training, uh, we decided to um, design it to provide a series of short courses on critical dates and deadlines in the delivery process, which have been distilled um, from our more intensive federal aid series, the local assistance academy and other trainings that we offer please do consider registering for those more in-depth courses when you're able to attend them. We always put on trainings. We have a lot to offer. Today is a series of hard hitting short courses on the topics that you see here on the agenda. Okay, um, we do have uh, three breaks planned, um, but in order to fit in all of these topics in the time available, we'll be moving along at a pretty good clip. Um, however, we still would like to hear from you directly in order to refine today's session for the future. So we've built in two round robins to gather your input on future training topics at the beginning of the day um, and any suggestions that you might have for our improvement at the end of the day. We wanna make sure that this works for you, okay, meet your needs. Sac State's gonna walk us through that process when we get there, so please follow their instructions. Uh, in essence, it's very fun and easy to participate We'll be using a real-time polling tool called Mentimeter, which will require you to copy a link provided in the chat and paste that into a new browser tab on your end, then follow the prompts provided so you can provide us with your input, okay? That was housekeeping. We're going to stay on time. 
So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dee and to Don for them to share a leadership message on this innovative training partnership that we've established. Dee? Hey, thanks, Neil. Welcome, everybody. You know what, Don, I, I definitely want to pass it to you and, and really appreciate the RTPA group, uh, yourself, Yvonne, for really um, shepherding this with us. So do you mind? I'll definitely pass for you because I'm always doing opening remarks. I figured, you know what, Don, <laughs> let's do open remarks and then it'll dovetail to mine. So over to you, Don. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So welcome, everybody. I'm Don Vatisse. I'm the moderator this fiscal year for the statewide RTPA group. And so beha on behalf of the RTPA group, I'm happy to see that we have so many people online today. It was overwhelming the interest and I'm pleased uh, and very thankful local assistance and Sac State were able to accommodate everybody. Uh, there are very important talk, topics that are going to be covered today. And this is just the first of what we hope to be regular workshops to cover all these important topics that impact local and regional agencies. And so I want to give a big thank you to local assistance for putting this on for us today and for their commitment to continuing this on a regular basis. And I really do also want to thank my predecessor, um, Yvonne Garcia from Butte County Association of Governments for spearheading this effort during his time as moderator of the RTPA group. So uh, my message today is that this experience is going to be what we make of it. So please look for those opportunities to participate actively today and to provide input into future topics for these workshops. And so thank you, Dee, very much. And thanks for letting me make my remarks. I'll pass it back to you. Don, thank you. Thanks so much. Again, thank you to you, the RTP group, Yvonne Garcia, um, and our local assistance team. I know there's been a lot of rehearsal sessions, a lot of agenda setting, lots of discussion on what are the needs and focus that you'd like local assistance to provide. And I think we've taken all that, those comments, listened intently and put together the um, critical dates training today. So we strive for continuous improvement, innovation, efficiency, and definitely active engagement. Of course, our partnership and thus kind of increasing our technical assistance to everybody here. Um, I'm excited. The team put together a critical, a critical dates presentation or training. I believe there's going to be a lot more questions and needs coming forward. Again, echoing Don, uh, please put those forward. It helps us focus and refine uh, training as well as even monitoring assistance along the way. This isn't, you know, just a one day activity, but I think it's over the life of any program and project and beyond. So whether you're new to local programs or more senior or more senior partner, I really hope you take away a lot of great information and put that into practice. Um, we're gonna do everything we can uh, to assist you. And again, I think just to kind of keep it short and sweet, thanks for joining. And then off back to you, Neil. All right, very good. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Dee. And thank you also to Yvonne, uh, previous chair of the RTPA group for inspiring this event and bringing us all together. Um, we're really excited about this, uh, maybe a bit nervous, frankly, because this is our first venue of this nature. We got 565 people on board right now, so we could really use your help to make this successful. Um, as you see on the bottom, you have a couple really important tools. Um, we will not be using the raise hand function because while well, we're not taking questions directly from you live, we're going to be using the Q and A um, chat, Q and A and chat functions as I mentioned. So please pull those up and be prepared to watch the dialogue um, as it unfolds. So um, for our first round robin, um, uh, Sherry, what we're basically hoping for here is to hear from you. Um, in, in looking at today's list of topics, what additional challenge areas should we address in the future? Okay, that's the bottom line. We got a series of questions. Um, Sherry, let's go ahead and pull up the Mentimeter and, and you can walk us through that. Sure, great. Thanks, Neil. So I'm gonna put some directions into the chat box. So give me just a moment to paste those in there for you. Okay, there you go. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so you're going to be going to menti.com. And your code is 
I'm one three four zero seven two two six. And we're going to go over three different questions. This is going to be your first. What is your role in the local assistance process? Just go ahead and go to menti.com. Use this code here and start typing in your answers. If you're having problems access, accessing menti.com, do feel free to go ahead and put your answer into the chat pod and we can go ahead and get you that way. Neil, you do see we've got a bunch of answers coming in. If you do remember in Menti, the larger the answer becomes, that means uh, more people are replying with that answer. We do have some answers in chat. Thanks, Tracy, we do. We have consultant and project engineer. And somebody is questioning, what is an SPOC? Oh, good one, good one. Um, we got that question just the other day. It's a single point of contact. Um, one of the uh, regional um, best practices that maybe we can highlight in the future um, is making sure that every member agency of an RTPA or MPO has a single point of contact to funnel critical path information and training uh, bulletins, um, process changes that come through local assistance to all of the staffs, staff members of, of their local agency. So as we can see here, you know, we have a lot of the kinds of folks that I introduced um, at the outset here. Lots of project managers, um, lots of engineers, folks working on environmental, folks working on programming um, and delivery, um, representatives of their local agency. So again, I think that the point here is it illustrates just how diverse of a crew of team members statewide work in the local assistance arena, and hence how we're trying to shape a program of training topics to meet all of the needs of those various functions. Stockton, Oakland, Banning. We got uh, jurisdictions um, and, and county regional agencies from across the entire state today. And we're now almost hitting the 600 mark in terms of participants. Great, we have 318 people who are participating in the Menti right now. Thank you, everyone. Would you like to move to the second question? Let's do it. So here's your second question. What challenge areas do you face with the local assistance process? So you'll be able to find that in the same place where you just were. Perfect. Looks like we're getting some answers and these will just start scrolling as we get more. And in the chat, we did have somebody say right away clearance. Very good. Um, also, feel free to use the chat to clarify or expand on your response in the Mentimeter. For example, I see a response in Mentimeter saying the math. I would love to know a little bit more about that. Again, the purpose of this exercise is so we can walk away with lessons learned from today and develop a next program of subjects um, to help continue this process of, of meeting your needs. We're also seeing in the chat regulations and guidelines, procurement, clear guidance, mm -hmm. too much paperwork, funding, no schedule of project delivery, NEPA and right away, too many rules. Um, side note, although it's not the focus of today, um, we could certainly think about in the future having a session on the various process improvement efforts that Dee mentioned at the outset 
um, our risk-based stewardship and oversight initiatives to help, again, uh, deal with some of these comments regarding too complicated, too much paperwork. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's not the focus of today, but there's a lot of stuff that we're doing to help um, streamline the process to the best of our ability, given the federal requirements that are imposed upon us as the State Department of Transportation. Securing a few more popping into the Menti. And a few more into the chat, Neil, as well. The LAPM 3A, Caltrans Cal staff turnover at DLAE. Um, so just uh, as we wait for a few more responses, um, thank you again for helping make this a success right off the bat. Um, we did structure today uh, around a series of hard hitting short courses on key takeaways. Um, there seem to be a lot of comments here about just general understanding of the process. Um, this is going to be really helpful for us, as I mentioned, to refine this course and think about different ways that we can approach training. Um, to meet the, the wide gamut of stakeholders that we interact with from fresh and new to industry to seasoned veterans. Obviously, there's a wide spectrum of needs, um, and this is going to help us develop, uh, tailor uh, future trainings um, to meet the, the needs of those different constituents. I uh, see the comment workflow. That's also a good comment to help us develop new graphics. Um, and visual aids to help map the flow of the process. Um, so that's definitely a lot of uh, heavy lifting on our part um, to help make sure that we disseminate out to you guys all the information needed. Oh, this is very interesting. I see a comment here about short staffing at city or local agency. And we've definitely heard in the past that local agency structural uh, challenges or constraints such as uh, capacity um, staffing consistency has been a challenge. So, you know, please do think about and add to the chat ways that, you know, if there are any uh, ways that, that we can help you with those attrition, um, uh, those attrition issues over time. <clears throat> Okay, Sherry, let's give it maybe just say another 30, 45 seconds and let's go ahead and move on to our next one. Sounds great. Thank you, everybody. All right, so here's your third question for this session. What additional training topics would you like to see in the future? And again, taking a look at the list of topics we're gonna to cover today in the agenda, um, think about what's missing. Uh, what would you like to hear from us on in the future? At the end of the day, we'll be asking you questions in terms of did we hit the mark in terms of detail um, or did we adequately cover the intricacies versus the key takeaways. Uh, that'll be this afternoon's round robin. Right now, we're sort of looking for topic areas that we want to make sure that we cover for you guys. This can be programs. This can be processes. This can be policies or procedures. And as we see question, uh, comments rolling in, again, feel free to use the chat to expand. We see a couple comments on invoicing. Um, you know, provide us with a little extra uh, texture there. Um, what about invoicing is a challenge for you? Um, 
the better responses that were more focused responses we get from you, the more focus, focus we can make future trainings. Great, great question. One that we're chewing on right now in the chat. Um, I'll just read a couple here. How extensive do we need to be uh, in terms of public outreach during COVID? Um, we just, uh, Caltrans participated in a, a speaker series with the American Planning Association and the Association of Environmental Professionals, sharing some best practices on that very subject. So that sounds like a great opportunity to circle back around on that um, and provide a little bit more detail and some best practices. One of the other things I think we're seeing um, emerging here is um, discipline specific focus, as in maybe everybody doesn't need to know about the um, requirements for developing PSE packages, for example. But at the outset, we talked about how many different functions that we have. That sounds like that might be a very good focus training for that subset of the local assistance family, so to speak. Um, as we, Sherry, wait for the last couple um, responses to, to roll in here, um, I want to definitely throw something out here for you all to think about um, as we look ahead to the future. Um, undoubtedly, there are local and regional best agent, uh, best uh, local and regional agency best practices. If you guys have solved some issues out there, um, if you guys have come up with great solutions to the persistent challenges to the critical path and of the delivery process, reach out to us and let us know. Um, this is our first one and we'd love to have uh, more of a, of a partnership and a, a co-presenting role with some of our external agencies that like to peer share some of the great solutions that they've come up with um, in the past. And again, how to streamline the process. Again, that's not the focus of today, but we've got a lot to share with you in terms of this, the efforts that we have um, in the works to, to do that very thing. Indirect cost allocation rates, grant funding processes. This is great participation. Um, we really, really appreciate it. As you might imagine, the virtual arena is particularly challenging for, for trainers like us. So your participation and engagement not just gives us valuable tactical input for refinement for the future, but it also really helps make sure that you know, we're, we're engaged with you and you're engaged with us. And this is a two-way dialogue um, as best as we can accommodate it given our time constraints and the number of total participants that we have. Um, Sherry, we still have um, responses coming in. Um, I would defer to you, I suppose, in terms of um, we, it looks like we're doing good on time. Should we give it another minute here? Yeah, absolutely. We can give it another minute if you want to put in another answer or two. We've still got some time. Are there are other, other thoughts that have crossed your mind that you'd like to enter. Um, we're also seeing a lot of great opportunity for synergy here between programs. Uh, I, see a, I see a request here to address in the future construction award and closeout um, from the environmental perspective. That's really, really important to make sure that all of our environmental commitments are in your bid packets and that you've monitored and implemented all of your environmental commitments. And we have proof of that during closeout. So you can get reimbursed for any related environmental mitigation costs. So that's a great crossover between implementation and environmental, for example, or utility certification, great crossover between right of way and design. Yeah. 
Oh, I see a really interesting comment. This is gives us a lot of creative juices in terms of um, developing future courses. I would love to see a bridge design in the North State or preferably um, online. Um, you know, one of the things that we do in our environmental course for the federal aid series that I mentioned earlier is that we have hypothetical projects. And what we do is we actually use a bridge project. So please think about signing up for the environmental or the NEPA course in the federal aid series because we've designed that all around a hypothetical project to talk about how we look at a project scope, how we look at environmental context, and then plan our technical studies, and hence, of course, our, our project's critical path schedule around all of those technical study requirements and even um, permitting consultation steps. Um, and thank you for folks that are putting um, resources and links into the chat. We will be, as I mentioned, copying all of this for and disseminating for future reference. But these links, if you are so interested, you can go to bookmark um, to sign up for one of our one of our trainings, any one of our numerous trainings. Um, Beth says she hopes that we continue online training post COVID. So do I, frankly. <laughs> so do we at Sac State. Yeah, it's been quite the wild ride. Um, I'm sure everybody has been experiencing their own adaptation to this new normal. Um, and it sounds like nobody really knows what the next normal is gonna look like. So thank you all for helping make this a success. Okay, Sherry, I'm looking at the clock. That's a lot of input for us to chew on. This is exactly what we were hoping for in terms of this round robin. Okay, um, go ahead and stop that, Sherry. And um, we do have, um, so we we can have a little bio break here. Um, we, we do have a brief break planned right now as we queue up our first substantive presentation. So um, Sherry, if you wouldn't mind putting on a timer, um, we'll go ahead and resume in five minutes. Um, we're going to digest your input and think about how we might be able to address it moving forward. Um, project end dates is going to be our first topic for the day.
I love that timer. That's a, a little bit like how my teenage daughter seems to keep track of time. <laughs> that was that was fun. Um, so we're back. Um, I would just as a reminder, if anyone out there has great solutions or best practices that they'd like to partner with us on on presenting in a sort of a peer sharing capacity in the future, please put your your name and your contact information in the chat so we can get a hold of you guys. Whether you're a city, a county, a RTPA, or an MPO, there's lots of great solutions out there, and we'd love to to join um, forces with you, so to speak. Okay. So um, Peter, um, take us away. We got uh, project end dates as our first uh, technical topic for the for block number one. All right, let me share my screen to bring up the PowerPoint. But uh, first of all, um, one thing kind of point out, we point out the, the issue of training that, yeah, when you're in person, you get a better rapport. But one thing about virtuals, there's no way we get reach out to over 600 people in one event. So. That's the one advantage of, of this thing is we are reaching out to a large range of group, group of people. Uh, once again, I'm Peter Anderson. I've been, I'm a retired annuitant with Caltrans returned as a training officer, basically. I'm responsible for developing a lot of a training that my office, the Office of Project Implementation has, does. I've been doing the federal aid course, et cetera. So, um, so here I was asked to kind of lead this in critical dates. When this was first put together, the title was deadline dates. And that kind of had a connotation that just didn't quite fit. And lo and behold, critical dates is what, is what we came up with. So critical date simply is date that is one that has been established in federal and or state regulations. Of course, failure to meet a certain critical date may lead to delay, delay or the loss of federal and or state funding. So we're going to be talking a lot of these things apply to both on the federal side and the state side. And as you see in your agenda, here's the topics we're going to be talking about. Project end date, inactive projects, timely obligations, PE over 10, construction award adjustments, effective construction engineering, the reversion date and CWA, cooperative work agreement, time of use of funds, which is highway, and then we have some programs. We have the, the HSIP, Highway Safety Improvement Program, Bridge Program, Emergency Relief, and then last, single audit report. And kind of give you an idea how the, where these fall, this table shows which topics really are fall under the federal, which fall under, under state. So um, just give you an idea of where the thing, majority of them are of course, federal. And project end date. This is what was established by FHWA was through, through law was that they wanted a period of performance. This is the time when time frame of which eligible federal project costs can be incurred. And of course, it's start, when it starts, starts with your first authorization, your E76, when it's approved by FHW, and ends when the agency reaches the estimated pro project end date for the work phase. So it ends with the date that we establish. And el eligible costs have to incur during this period of performance time period. There's one exception, and that is at-risk PE. At-risk PE allows you to start your PE costs prior to doing an authorization, but those costs will be eligible. You, since you would not have done a E76, you would not have started with your first authorization. So you do have a period where at-risk PE will, will, will be eligible. So establishing the project, the project end date. And this is, this is estimated the phase completion date. And we talk about phase is because we do a different project end date. We do one for PE, we can have a different one for right away, we can have a third one for construction. So each one will have a different end date. And they go about how to calculate, estimate these dates. 
And it's required to be shown on our LAPM 3A with every request for authorization. And so the end date is established by adding 12 months to the estimated phase completion, estimated phase completion date and allows for potential delays. So how do we go about calculating this? And that is that the PE, PE and right away, the, S, the completion of that phase is the anticipated date of construction advertisement. When you're advertising a project for construction, it is assumed <laughs> very strongly that your PE is completed and your right away is completed and cleared. For construction, the completion is, is the anticipated date when your board or council does contract acceptance, meaning that you're releasing the contractor from his duties, that the, all the project has completed and therefore the construction is, is done. One thing I wanna say about this PED though, is that you, the local agencies, you have 100% control of when this date is established. So you have, you know your, 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 your schedule, anticipated schedule. So you have complete control over this. This is not a date that is arbitrary or, or um, established through other rules. This is date is established by your schedule of your project. And of course, updating the PED, it is, you can update it. And the simple one is you, we update the PE when we advance, go to the next phase of work. I've mentioned that we do a, we, ask, we start the PE phase and the right away. And those two dates should be correspond with each other because they'll based off the uh, estimated advertisement date. And then when you go to construction, we'll update that date should be updated automatically based on a revised schedule based on from being advertisement to when the project is completed. The PE, you want to make sure you monitor the PED date. If needed, the local agents may request that it be revised. And so you need to be able to justify with FHWA the reasons for a change in the date. This last year, COVID was a big issue. A lot of agencies had to shut down. And so schedules got, you know, out of, out of, out of sync with what the work should have been done. So there was a lot of need to update. And there was a lot of projects that, you know, people weren't monitoring it. And so we have some gaps that occurred in eligibility of reimbursement because of that. And of course, any costs incurred after the PED are not eligible for federal reimbursement. So that's why it's important to monitor it. So if the PED is revised after the date has lapsed, the, that costs incurred between the expiration and the date FHW authorizes the revised PED are not eligible. And so, and then FHWA also has put, this is, this is something FHWA has stated, they want to see in, all the invoicing to occur within 120 days after the PED has expired. So if you've completed your project, um, we have other things that come into play that really this 120 days may not be critical, but it's still important to be aware FHW wants to see these in, the invoicing to be, to be done um, before af, within the 120 days. So your, your work can be completed. You still have 120 days to get that invoicing in. So couple of places to find out where your P, what your PED is in case you forgot. Um, our authorization summary. This, this summary is, is, re, is supplied typically to every agent through our district DLA, the district local assistance engineer. And so that this will be supplied once the authorization is done. And so lo and behold, up in the upper right-hand corner, is the project end date for a particular project. Also on our LP2000 finance letters, 
That comes out of headquarters office. We'll su supply that finance letter to an agency after every action. And the same thing here, the project end date shows up on the finance letter. So you have two sources in case you need to know to get verify what is the official date in case you've, you've forgotten. And always look at the most current uh, document that you have received and you'll see that project end date. Inactivity, inactive projects. And exit. FHWA, they have a nationwide target of inactive, inactive unexpended balance is 2%. So department considers a project inactive if no payment, payment activity has occurred within six months. And that's in the master agreement, it's also in the program, program supplement. That is one of our re requirements that we put forward. FHWA goes beyond that and says, hey, we'll consider it. They really truly consider, and that's the key people is FHWA is that no payment activity has occurred within 12 months or more. So if a project is inactive for the six months, the department, I mean, we haven't received an invoice within the next five months, total 11, the agency will need to start providing justification for inactivity. What has caused this to be no invoicing? Uh, And then what results of inactive projects is project obligations could be removed by FHWA if the agency does not provide justification. Or this one is more critical. Future obligations may be delayed if prior phases are inactive. I was working on a project fairly recently that was inactive for the PE phase the agency was coming forward forward with construction fhwa was concerned about that adding that additional authorization to the inactive balance because that's all that happened is that that authorization those additional funds count against that invoicing balance that creates the percentage and that they wanted to know the status of an invoice is the invoice is the agency going to invoice for the work the funds that have already been authorized meaning pe and i was able to get a firm commitment that an invoice was in the process and fhwa then did obligate the construction funds but if i was not able to get that um concurrence that it, that PE was going to be invoiced, FHWA was going to hold off on authorizing the construction. Timely obligations. This is a fairly new metric that has just recently been deployed. And so we haven't really, in California, we have not really uh, implemented it yet. But we are going to be starting to, and it will be one of our key metrics that we start reporting when we start talking about delivery, et cetera. And it's primarily one way to avoid a project from becoming active is a timely obligation. And what timely means is that a project's initial obligation is defined if that initial reimbursement, initial invoicing occurs within 270 days. Realize that's nine months that we get the authorities. We get the authorization, go through that six months and you're into that window between six and 12 months, but you're getting it done before the project becomes inactive. So our goal is to reach 100% timely obligation rate. That is simply it, that is the goal. Every project that gets authorized, we do get an invoice within that 270 days. Nation, national average is approximately 85%. Unfortunately, California local assistance, we're well below. And when we did a report, we were at 40% with an average duration of over 300 days. We have a lot of work to do in getting better. But with your help and with pro programs like this, awareness 
of these things, hopefully we can start getting our rate up to that 100%. Let's be, let's think let's California can at least get over 85%. Preliminary injury or PE over 10 years. This is CFRs, 23 CFR, 630. In the, I'm going to read this. In the event that right away acquisition for or actual construction of the road for which preliminary engineering is undertaken is not started by the close of the 10th fiscal year following the fiscal year in which the project is authorized, the state transportation department or the will be will pay FHWA the sum or sums of federal funds paid to the transportation department under the terms of the agreement. The state may request a time extension for any preliminary engineering project beyond the time, beyond the 10 year limit with no repayment of federal funds. FHWA may approve this request if it considers reasonable. Long story short, when you get your authorization for PE, you have that fiscal year plus 10 additional years to take that project to either right away or construction. There are a lot of projects out there though where environmental can be very complex and that 10 years doesn't seem like, doesn't, it seems like a long period of time, but like I said, in the complex environmental world, 10 years, uh, is not that long of a period of time. So with all the studies, but it's not to say that you're in trouble. The issue here is that you do need to get approval from FHWA if you're going to go beyond the 10 years. So the 10 year period starts at the end of the fiscal year that FHWA, so a project authorized in the 2021 federal fiscal year has up to September 30th of 2031 to proceed to right away a construction phase. So gives you that time period. But here's the case, projects utilizing at-risk PE. The 10 year period does not immediately start. It starts when the at-risk PE authorization is approved by FHWA. So the time that PE occurred during the at-risk does not count against the 10-year rule. Here's one way, if you do have a very complicated project, you can use the at-risk PE. Just be aware that when you do at-risk PE, you're not eligible to seek reimbursement. You make sure you follow the federal procedures. And then once the authorization for the PE occurs, then you can seek, seek reimbursement. And of course, end of tracking is satisfied when agency substantially begins right away or construction activities. If, if these are being federally funded, you know, we'll process an E76 for either right away or construction. For example, if right away is not being done through with federal funds, it would just be a matter of the agency reporting that they have started the right away phase. So, and same with construction. If the construction is not federally funded, acknowledging that the construction has been advertised and awarded would suffice. There's an additional rule of right away over 20 years, kind of the same thing. But so if you go to the right away phase, uh, you have an, another clock that's count, counting down, and that's that event that actual construction of the road on the right of way is not undertaken by the close of the 20th year following the fiscal year when the project is authorized, state DOT, same thing. So right away, you have to get to construction except with a 20 year, 20 year rule. Construction award adjustments. Prior to submitting the first construction invoice and within 60 days of contract, local agencies must forward a water package to DLAE per PSA Covenant 600. And this is also required before, prior to, like I said, invoicing. Yes, construction invoice. You can either submit the award package prior to or with the 
con first construction invoice. If the award amount is more significantly less than the amount estimated at time of construction, the award package submitted to the DLE will be used to update the project agreement. So we have the ability to start doing some shifting of monies. And that to do that, you also have to submit the LAPM3 as part of the award package. And so if you have savings under or construction and your construction engineering was underfunded, you can shift money from, from construction to construction engineering or vice versa. Here's another thing you can do. If your PE costs or right of way costs need to be adjusted up or down, you have the ability to move money into those phases also. If PE costs were you know, programmed and you had savings there and you needed to move that to construction, we can do that with, the construction, with this construction award, vice versa. You didn't cover all your costs. You have savings, you got good bids and you had savings under construction. You can move those savings to, to the PE phase. In addition, one of the things that can happen here is we talk about pro rata lump sum. That the general rule of thumb is if you're under, under the federal re maximum reimbursement rate, pro, a lump sum is the preferred methodology. If you're at the maximum reimbursement rate, pro rata is the choose, cho choice to do. If you have, like I said, a change in your cost to construction that changes it from being one or the other, you can also change your designation of reimbursement from pro rata to lump sum or vice versa. You can do that. And so there's a lot of flexibility that can be done during this time period. And then of course, construction adjustments, if you need additional funds, the local agencies may submit, you know, obtain additional funds from, from the MPOs, RTPAs could possibly approve additional funds for the STP block grant program or CMAC. If it's a pro program that's administered within headquarters, the HSIP bridge ATP, also, it's a possibility. It's not to say it's you know guaranteed, but there's always always a possibility. And I'm always a person that says, "Hey, go ahead and ask. Doesn't hurt to just ask." ATP is probably a little bit more complicated because that involves CTC, but definitely HSIP bridge program. And so, per the CFRs, it said the pro rata lump sum share may be adjusted, that's what I talk about, it may be adjusted before slight, shortly after contract award for any substantial changes. So this is where we get into it. And this is one of the key things. FHWA has interpreted the term shortly after contract award is no more than 90 calendar days after contract award. Be aware that you know, you're supposed to submit your award package within 60 days for your invoicing. So 90 days gives you a little additional cushion there. So when you do award a project, take a look, make sure you look at your, how the funds were authorized. Is, is the way they were initially authorized the best way to utilize your funds? And you the chance, like I said, to evaluate, to see that you're able to maximize the reimburse federal funds that you're going to be reimbursed. And so uh, that for future invoices involving the construction phase, the ministry must maintain the federal pro rata share as originally authorized if it's not adjusted at award. And and this is one of the key things. This is a, giving you an example here of a pro, it was both a, a failure to choose pro rata lump sum cor correctly and also failure to do a, an award adjustment that an agency was underfunded significantly. And unfortunately, they chose pro rata. So they were going to be reimbursed 
at a reimbursement rate. I'm just, I know it was like in the 60, 70 percentage rate. And so every invoice was going to be reimbursed at that level. Project was awarded a significant savings. They failed to submit an award adjustment. And so the in the in the award was like I said significantly save savings. And when it came to do the final in final invoicing and the final close out the project, the agency ultimately lost out on over a hundred thousand dollars of federal funds that could have been left to the project and um, utilized instead of the non non federal match. So it is imperative to look at these and make sure and work with your district to get an award adjustment done properly. So which brings us to effective construction engineering. Sometimes when you do your construction authorization is because your budget is such that uh, you don't have enough funds and that you have to decide whether we're going to put all our our construction funds to construction etc so but the you get to see to be reimbursed for your construction engineering they must be specifically included in the lap 3a and authorized by fhw to be for federal reimbursement so it has to be segregated out but you know, like I said, give me an example that if your budget was such that oh, we don't have enough money to cover both, we'll, we'll just plan on utilizing all our federal funds to construction, and that we'll do our construction engineering under our own on our, our own forces, and we'll pay for it ourselves. So, but if you got the bids came in and you've got great bids, and you got all of a sudden you got this influx of money that you now need to use, you can move it to construction engineering. But that construction engineering is authorized after construction begins. It's only those costs incurred after the date that CE authorization is occurs by FHWA that you're eligible for federal reimbursement. It's not retroactive back to the initial construction. And so an agency, so key thing here would be is that I always recommend putting a, you know, if you, you're falling in that category where you're having you know, most of your money in construction, put a token amount under construction engineering because then you get you are eligible to then seek reimbursement retroactively back to the initial authorization. If the bids came in the way you expected and you don't need that money under construction engineering, your award adjustment can then take that money off of that and put it to construction. So you do have the opportunity there to take that money you know you're not going to use under construction engineering and apply it to construction. And here's another thing is that if you have no other source of, of, of invoicing, but you can use your CE prior to construction to prevent the project from becoming inactive. So you can charge some CE costs to a project to avoid that in inactivity. Uh, doing a time check there, Neil. I think I've zipped right along and such that. Which we love. Yeah. What that does, um, if you're um, at the end of your, your final topic of ex, uh, effective construction engineering, we have quite a number of questions in the chat. Um, okay. Some of them you may, oh, I'm sorry, in the Q&A box, I want to clarify, um, in the Q&A box. So again, remember everybody at the bottom, along with all of your two utilities is one that says Q&A. Looks like we got 45 questions in there. Um, I know. We, also, we also have just a final note, um, Peter, is that we will be providing a copy of the presentations from today, um, a, a transcript of the Q&A, as well as the chat, and hopefully a link to the recording from today. So we will follow up with you. All of the questions that you're, an you're putting into the chat, um, whether they get answered effectively today or or, or not, um, we will be able to respond um, in follow-up. So with that, Peter, um, you've answered some of these questions as a part of your presentation. Um, looks like we got uh, just shy of a half an hour um, on our timed agenda. 
Okay. Um, what would you think about maybe um, opening up the, the, uh, the Q&A window yourself um, and take a look at them? We can skip all of the observations and comments. Um, and maybe if you wouldn't mind um, picking out as, as many as you think you might be able to tackle in a succinct manner, um, ones that maybe are a little bit more detailed or maybe you didn't adequately address in your presentation uh, just now. Well, I'll just, I'll just start scanning down them. Um, if uh, somebody else is out there kind of help monitoring, they can maybe help me pick out the most important uh, important questions since I'm, I'm only able to look at a few at a time. Starting off, can you set a ridiculously late project end date when filling up three? And the answer is really no. We don't want you submitting something ridiculous. We want you to base the project end date on a realistic project schedule. You start the project, you should have an estimated time period of when you're going to, you know, with your milestones in terms of establishing, you should have a good idea when you're going to be advertising the project. And like I said, we add in one year to allow for some delays, you know, that, so you do have that, that built in delay. So the only time it comes into a problem is if the delay is going to be over one year. And then the same thing for construction. You know, when you you should have, you know, when you do your construction, you know, just simple things of what's your number of construction days, you know, and then adding some time period to allow cl close out, et cetera. So the the dates that we use, the milestones are should be well defined, you know, in your um, in your project schedule. So we do not recommend because FHWA will turn their nose up on those. Um, I'm just looking, many cases, the design consultant remains on board throughout construction, provide design services. To do. Um, this, this one's a little, I'm not a consultant expert. Um, and so it's it's a matter of how you set up your contra contract, but in theory, if you're dealing with construction changes, yes, you have your consultant on for PE, but really that is a CE cost that if occur that's occurring there. So um, that so. You know, being able to utilize that same consultant for PE costs versus CE costs, I'm not quite sure. Um, you know what's what's legally allowed. So, like I said, I'm not a CE a consultant expert. So, my screen jumped. Um, next one. Uh, Completion, should the state be able to provide reconciliation to the department furnished materials provided on prop project? Same, same thing there. Hopefully we get the answer to that is yes, but sometimes those things do get delayed. And so we'll work realizing as questions get put in here, my screen jumps. So I... No problem, Peter. Okay. We appreciate you scrolling through there. Says, are, why aren't we local agencies only notified of the PED when it's too late or critical, critically expired timeline? Um, we're getting better at that. We are starting to develop um, oh, a um, dashboard system for local agencies. And this is something that's under development, a dashboard system where you can go in and you'll be able to look at all your projects and see where all these, a lot of these critical dates that we're talking about, you'll be able to see them in the dashboard and see, report and verify it yourself. So we are getting better at reporting this. Um, I know districts do different things um, in terms of working with their agencies and reporting critical critical information. So, um, yeah, we want to get better at getting this information. Uh, we do have a, a re, you know a like I said our our inactive project list. That's all, that's available on our website, so you can go on and see if your projects are inactive directly. So, 
uh, bear with us. We're, we're definitely working towards getting more and better information out to you local agencies. So if there are project savings during construction from a practical perspective, how can those savings be transferred to the PE phase? Um, so if you don't going through the construction process and you get during the construction phase that you actually have savings, um, we've allowed some movement at the at the final invoicing to cover costs. So there is a, there's ability to catch some of those costs during during final invoicing. But if we use PE funds during the construction, how does this affect PED? Once again, the PED, there is a single date that applies um, ultimately for the entire project. So once you go to construction, that PED date um, is such that it, it moves out to some date in the future. So any work prior to that should still be eligible as long, as long as there's no gap. Here's, you know, if we create a gap, so, but if you're trying to use, it says PE funds during construction. So if you're trying to say, and you're using that consultant and you're using charging to PE phase, um, yes, you'd still be eligible because that work occurred during that active period of, a, of the period of performance. That's the key. If the work occurs during the time period of a period of performance effectiveness, all, all expenditures, whether it's PE construction right away, would be eligible. Is the 2% goal based on the department? The 2% goal is an FHWA um, metric. That is their target. And it is it's basically looking at total unexpended, this is tricky parts, the total unexpended um, federal funds to projects that are have have hit inactivity against basically the total amount of obligation authority the department has. So, as I mentioned, we had a PE project that was the PE funds were inactive, and soon as we authorized construction, that increased that total amount of of inactivity dollar amount. So even though it's a different phase, it's still, and the, and the 12 months, yes, those, that is also a FHWA PowerPoint, yes. Somebody here mentioned about close a project, Caltrans has continued contractor landscaping. Typically when you have something like that, which is environmental mitigation work, after the project, we tr split that project off as a separate contract, a, sep sec a separate project. And therefore we close out the parent project and proceed forward with the landscape mitigation, um, environmental mitigation um, as a secondary project. And it would have its own um, deadlines. Like, I'm starting to go. Please elaborate pro rata lump sum. If con bids came under estimate, how should we submit award adjustment to maximize? Also, see already allocated. Okay. Pro rata versus lump sum. It's pro rata basically says whatever we're going to, whatever reimbursement rate we're going to maintain, that's going to be the reimbursement rate for the entire project. Lump sum based means that the amount of federal funds we have on the project is going to be fixed and any cost adjustment, the, the reimbursement ratio could go up or down. Um, of course, the, the choice I mentioned is that when you're dealing with pro rata, the best thing to do is use that when you're maximizing the federal reimbursement rate. Uh, for example, 
88.53%. Uh, if you're going to be held at that, pro rata is the preferred choice because if the cost of the project goes up or down, you're going to be able to still get reimbursed at 88.53. If you're underfunded, lump sum, or $100,000 and um, you have $100,000 of federal funds and you have $150,000 project, so your, your reimbursement rate is 66.67%. So if the cost of the pro project goes down, that initial savings of, of funds will actually be 100% local against the local local share. And it'll always be the local share is, until you get to the point where you hit the maximum reimbursement rate. I'm using the example 88.53, and then that kicks, that kicks in. Um, so the, so if you're, so if you start the project, assuming that you're at the maximum reimbursement rate and that you put 88.53% and then the bids came in, came in high that you do not have, you have to cover that cost increase with a local share, that award adjustment would be appropriate to change it from pro rata to lump sum and that your, your federal funds would be fixed at that, this is all assuming, like I said, you know, if you're not able to get additional funds to help co help cover the cost of the project, and um, with with federal funds and funds all being um, tight commodity, you know, it's 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 sometimes it's yes, it's very difficult to get cost increases, but you know that I know I've worked with agencies um, under the MT MTC umbrella that worked with MTC that they say had savings on one of their projects and they got MTC to agree to take the savings and move them to another project in the same, the same um, uh, district, same agency. So they were able to do that. So um, I'm going to say every uh, MPO RTPA works that way, you know, but it does sometimes does work where you can get savings and move them around. So, so the key here is, is look at it to see does am I am I at the maximum reimbursement rate or not, and that that kind of helps you make the choice. If you are at the maximum reimbursement rate, pro rata is the direction to go. So if construction bids come in significantly higher than anticipated, will FHA guidance, if there is available adjustments to the funds prior to award to ensure local agencies can pay for the project? Um, well, yes, I mean, the answer to that is yes. Um, we can do cost adjustments to a project. Um, the key one would be is that you would advertise the project and bids came in high and you kind of rescope the project a little bit to tweak it a little bit. We would actually want you to submit a revised E76 to, to adjust that scope such that we don't go forward, making it look like we are getting the same project that we initially authorized. If something had to be um, uh, removed. But we highly recommend sometimes, um, oh, what's the term I'm going to use? Uh, I'll come to me in a moment here about um, additive bids. Um, you know, if you do have projects that are, you know, questionable whether you're going to be able to make your scope, additive bid is a good way to work with that in such that you have a, a bidding schedule that sort of says, okay, here's our base bid and here's our additives that if our bids come in acceptable, then we can work our way down the bid schedule. So um, if you do have projects like that, I highly recommend looking at additive bid. Is the PE the same as end of construction phase or closeout phase? No, um, project end date. Uh, 
end of construction we define that as when it's construction is accepted by your 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 governing board and so the ped would be the 12 months after that um close out close out phase is such that in our our guidance we basically say you have 100 from the time you finish the project you have 180 days to do your final final invoicing so if the date is there was no delay in your project end date is based off of your contract you actually have 180 days to do final final invoicing then there's still 180 days that would end up being until you get to your project end date so they they all float around the same time period um, but it's just like i said if it if there's little delays that occur it's possible that things could slide beyond and we may ask for a, an adjustment to your project end date to allow that final invoicing. So it so be aware that, um, you know, yes, you may be complete the project, but realize that we're going to come up to, to that project end date before final. And so we'll need to process a project end date adjustment to allow for the final invoicing. Lots of questions about PED. So after receiving these seven construction, but there are funds from the PE phase, can agents continue to submit reimbursement requests for PE? Absolutely. In actuality, um, a PE phase is designed or is, is meant to cover your construction advertisement costs. Um, so that when you go through the process of, of going through advertising award, it's a, traditionally, it's been targeted to use that against PE phase. Um, we do allow use the construction engineering because if there is some case of reasons that um, of inactivity, but if you still have funds available under PE, you should be able to invoice against PE and still not inactive. But if you had funds under right away um, and your PE is fully expended, you know that the right away phase is going to put you as being inactive. And then you can use your CE to help cover those costs and therefore get an invoice in and keep that right away component from being going inactive. Somebody asked the question, what does substantial right away mean when I talked about uh, the PE over 10 year rule? Um, I'm not a right away expert either. So um, the, pro the, the issue th thing here is that uh, in the right away phase, they mentioned about what if we only have temporary construction easements? When you start going into that temporary construction easement, that is definitely a substantial right away. Um, under the PE phase, there's some preliminary right away um, that is that is allowed, like said, doing some mapping, et cetera. But once you go beyond beyond just initially mapping and identifying your right away needs, once you go beyond that you fall under starting a substantial right away phase. So if you start doing any contact, any um, association with contacting any of the property owners, you're definitely entering a substantial uh, component of the right away phase. A lot of people asking the agent whether to choose lump sum or pro rata. I hopefully carried, you know, address that. 
I'm not sure what somebody's asking. Can we request an offset match? I'm not sure what that means. I'm not. Um, um, we've had programs. We've had what was called a tapered match. Um, the other one where we've allowed um, costs be adjusted for one phase to be out of sync with another phase. So that you want to get credit for your, for example, um, and total credits has kind of did away with a lot of this, um, but tapered match, et cetera, that the idea is that, yeah, flexible match, that's the other one. Tapered and flexible. The idea is that, okay, you want to get credit for meeting the federal match requirement, say for utilizing local funds or PE, but you're going to fund construction 100% with uh, federal funds. So flexible matching was one of the ways, but it's the toll credits has kind of done away with that concept. You're allowed to still do uh, your um, do use use the local funds under the PE phase and then 100% match that. If like I said, toll when when and if when toll credits go away, these these tapered and flexible matches will come back. It probably come back into play. Um, that they do require advance approval that to you have to have a funding plan approved and it'll be approved all through us and also approved i believe by fhwa to ensure that the matching is is done correctly so um the answer to that is yes you can i'm mean, assuming the offset was referring to flexible or tapered match so the answer is that yes you can do it still exists it's in our in our in our chapter three of our the lapm uh, but like I said, it hasn't been used with with um, implementation of toll credits. So as everybody can imagine, <clears throat> we have so many participants. We have a ton of questions. Um, Peter's done an abs absolutely excellent job fielding as many as possible. I wanted to remind everybody that when you open up your Q&A window, you have three main tabs in that window. Open questions, which haven't been answered yet. Um, as you've seen, many of those questions are on the same subject or different versions of the same question. Um, you'll see the answered tab, which has our subject matter experts responses to those questions. And then you'll see the dismissed column, which of course is just simply questions that have already been asked and answered multiple times. Um, we are going to be, um, as I mentioned, um, circulating a, a copy of the presentation from today, a transcript of the Q&A, including answers to questions that for the sake of time we haven't been able to answer, as well as all the information, links, and resources that are put into the chat. Um, we are at um, our um, break point um, at this time. Um, we do have a wrap up quiz for you to to sort of reinforce some of the, the key lessons and as Felicia pulls that up, I uh, would just like to reiterate that um, your input, particularly in terms of the level of detail, um, maybe even the possibility of being more more focused and in depth details on this subject or that subject is really going to help us refine this training for the future. Um, as again, Felicia pulls up the, our, our quiz um, to wrap up um, the, section, the, the first um, block of critical dates and deadlines. Um, one of the, I just want to reiterate, one of the um, bits of input that we got during the early planning phase for this event was a half day. We would definitely love to hear from you in the, in, and, and a, on a quarterly basis. Um, that was in response to some questions around like how much time do you have available for a training like this so that we can shoehorn our conversations and our, and our training topics into the time um, that you say that you have available for this. However, we would love to hear from you in the chat if you have any additional suggestions in terms of what level of detail and how much time should be allocated to these subjects.
Thank you, Peter. That was a lot of information that you shared. You did again an excellent job with such a great roundup of so many, um, so many very detailed and nuanced um, uh, technical topics. Well, uh, my understanding is FHWA will, or FHW, Sac State will be sending me all these questions. I will try to sort them into categories if not, somebody else doesn't do it for me, and and try to respond to them as best as best I can in this section here. Uh, so that, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll follow up. And so like I said, a lot of people were look, say, talking about pro rata lump sum. I highly recommend chapter three of our LAPM to get some info, always get some source of information. And like I said, I'll try to, I'll try to be a little clearer so people can, can understand it a little bit when we, when they follow up on these questions. Great, thank you, Peter. We'll stick with us while Felicia pulls up our, our, our wrap up quiz for um, critical dates, section number one. Um, as, as we hear answers to her questions, maybe we can pepper it with a little additional texture um, before we break for our first 10 minute um, at 1010. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Felicia Haslam. I'm the Office Chief of Project Implementation North. I have a couple of quiz questions. A poll quiz questions. I want to make sure um, that agencies understand the basics of what we're trying to teach um, and also just kind of get a feel on maybe what else is needed. Just four quick questions um, for you. So we're going to talk about period of performance. Um, maybe that's a new word, but what are the elements of the project period of performance? <clears throat> is it the estimated by the agency and established for each phase of the project? Time frame during which eligible federal costs can be incurred? Has an established project end date in which project costs beyond this date are not reimbursable or all of the above. So please click on your screen and um, the correct answer that you feel meets the period of performance. It does tie with the project end date. <clears throat> and we'll give you 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Okay. Great, yes, all of the above. So remember the period of, of performance goes with the project end date. Project end date does need to be extended. It is estimated by the agency per phase. So this is really on the agency to, to really um, understand their project and know how much time they need and extend that date before it expires if necessary because once that date has expired, as Peter mentioned, you don't want a gap. If there's a gap, we cannot reimburse you for that gap period. So it's re really important to make sure that you do extend those PEDs um, before they expire. And when I hear an agency is relying on Caltrans to tell them when their dates expire, that's a huge red flag for us. And um, so, and we realize maybe that's the case um, because we have a lot of dates going out there, right? So we're trying to figure out tools. So any suggestions you have um, will help us. Um, let us know what you need, how we can provide that. We are working on a few items, um, how to get those dates um, all in one area for everyone to um, look at that. Um, okay, next question. Inactive projects, another critical date um, is a project that has not been reimbursed for six months or more. Agency's overall success and delivery often correlates with the timing of the first invoice a project that doesn't exercise or answers A and B? Yeah, I made these pretty easy, huh? Again, we'll give you about five, 10 seconds. Okay. What do we pick? Ah, okay. So a little bit tricky. Um, <clears throat> So yes, it is a project that has not been reimbursed for more than six months. Uh, Peter mentioned our inactive rate that FHWA sets nationwide is 2%. Um, so we do try to stick below that. In our master agreement, we say, if you have not re uh, been reimbursed for six months, you are inactive. So we set that um, knowing that in a, a year at 12 months, you will become inactive and there's um, consequences for that, right? So in the master agreement, it does say you need to invoice at least every six months. So please invoice, invoice, invoice. The inactive is a big, um, a big deal for us. And then 
Um, B is also correct because an agency's overall success often does correlate with that first invoice. We have a lot of projects out there right now that have an invoice. It's been over six months um, going on a year. Um, so please invoice, check your projects out. If you haven't invoiced in a while, please do that. Um, inactive projects, kind of a big deal. All right, next question. PE over 10, another critical date. A project that is considered PE over 10 is a project that has not progressed to the right-of-way phase and acquired property, a project that does not have right-of-way and has not progressed to the construction phase, to be considered compliant with the PE over 10 rule, on-site construction or right-of-way acquisition must commence within the 10 years, 10 seconds, or all of the above. Okay, let's see how we did. So the PE over 10, um, you might not have heard a lot about that yet, but that will be another date that we will tackle. Um, a project that has not progressed to the, it's all of the above. So you have to move to the right-of-way phase. Right-of-way phase doesn't mean just my right-of-way phase is um, authorized or I have a right-of-way cert. It's if you need to acquire a property, you have acquired that property or you've moved to construction. So we'll send out more guidance on the PE over 10, but if you're over that PE over 10, uh, right now is the deadline. If your PE um, phase has been 10 years or more, um, please get in your time extension request because a lot of those expire September 30th. Um, if that's not in, we can't pay you after that. So starting October 1st, if you have over 10 years and you're still in the PE phase, um, please reach out to us um, because those are costs are not eligible. As a matter of fact, all the costs will have to be repaid. Um, if you go beyond that date. So PE over 10 is a critical one um, to make sure that your project's moving forward. Um, so reach out to us if you need to. Um, one more. CE authorization. When is construction engineering encouraged to be authorized on a project? A, always if it is a construction project. B, rarely. C, never. Or what is construction engineering? <laughs> All right, let's see how we did. Yes, please always put construction engineering on your project if you can, and you probably can, right? At least a thousand bucks, 2000, whatever it is, because um, we've ran into a lot of issues if an agency doesn't have construction engineering authorized and they're unable to um, invoice for construction costs, then those that project becomes inactive. Um, so there are, like I said, there are kind of consequences for not having a, an active project. So at all times, um, please authorize construction engineering, even if it's a little bit, because that will save you. That'll help you to be able to invoice in times when your construction award is delayed. Um, so we do ask, please authorize CE um, for federal funds with your construction. So that's all the questions I had for this morning session. So thank you. Um, if you have any other questions, please put them in the Q&A. We do plan to answer those. Um, there's a lot of questions in there. It gives us a feel for what we need to uh, work on and provide at the next training session. Thank you. Absolutely. A massive amount of content, a lot of detail um, to share with you um, via follow-up. Peter, do you have any summary takeaway that you'd like to provide um, for segment one? Um. Majority of what we talked about were definitely federal requirements. Uh, these are all pretty much apply to the e federal E76 process. And so um, if people have I always I'm going to plug our uh, federal aid series, we have a federal aid series class that uh, day one focuses a lot of what we talk about here in this in this course. And so, you know, be familiar with that. I always emphasize uh, chapter three of the LAPM is a great uh, resource also to help answer some questions. And so, um, like I said, it, it's just, I've been doing this for a long time and I still learn things every day. So um, don't be afraid to reach out to your DLAEs and ask questions. And, and I always emphasize one of the things out of a training class is that you may not pick up on all the information, but what it does, it allows you to ask smarter questions. And that's what I hope that we get out of any training class is that you, you, you know kind of 
a, get a good general feel of what, the, what to ask. And when you get the answer, it makes sense to you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and again, great plug for not just uh, the local assistance um, procedures manual, but the federal aid series. Um, back in the old days, federal aid series was one solid week, every single day, all day. That's a really great insight in terms of the level of detail that we drill down on through the federal aid series. Now those are separate, so you can take one course or take the, the different courses in, in any uh, order. But the main thing here is that there's a lot of guidance material. Please see our website. Please make sure that you're familiar and have a copy of the LAPM available for you to consult with. Do your homework, do your research. Um, and attend all of our various trainings. Um, before we break, um, there is one note or a question actually um, in the chat I'd like to address because I think it's really important to acknowledge this partnership and the fact that Caltrans can't answer all of the questions out there. So let me read this question. I am a new SPOC, single point of contact, and there's quite a, a lot of new information that I'm not sure what to do with. Um, what do new single points of contacts need to know? I sent this question in the chat. I tried to respond to that in chat, but here's, here's my encouragement to you. Um, don't forget there's a very, very critically important relationship between our RTPA and MPO partners and their local agency members. Um, you guys have your own internal policies and procedures. You have your own communication protocols. Please make sure that you are meeting together as the RTPA MPO regional agency and as the local agency to make sure that single point of contact roles and responsibilities and communication protocols in terms of the dissemination of really important information to all of the different players in the local assistance process is clear. That's not an answer, uh, 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 an answer for us to provide, but a conversation for you guys to have. Many of our RTPA and MPO partners have excellent local assistance uh, uh, support programs with even on-call consultants that provide a preliminary engineering, environmental consultation, scoping, scheduling, and delivery assistance. If you're a local city or a county, make sure that you're connected to your RTPA and MPO counterparts so that you can avail yourself of those kinds of services. And if you're a single point of contact, make sure that you're able to answer that question for yourself because that's really a, 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 a relationship that you have with your agency and with your regional agency. We're gonna go ahead and take a 10 minute break. Uh, Tracy, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the, the timer. Um, and again, as a final reminder, hopefully we'll definitely be providing the presentation, responding to all the questions we couldn't get to today and with a copy of our, of our Q&A and our chat as well as hopefully a link for the for the recording of today. Tracy, if you could pull up the um, the timer, let's go ahead and take a break. Everybody grab some coffee, um, use your restroom or anything else you need to do, and we'll see you in 10. Thank you.
All right, we are back. Amy, we've got uh, reversion dates and cooperative work agreements coming up next, yeah? Yep, yes. All right, let's do it. So, like... There you go, Amy. Okay. Thank you. Hello, uh, welcome back. Um, my name is Amy. Um, I'm from the Headquarters Subvention Management Branch. I have with me today are my two colleagues, uh, Peggy Sue and Carmen Wells. Um, they will be helping me monitor the Q&A box. So if you have any questions throughout um, my presentations, please um, enter it in the Q&A and they will respond to your questions. Today I will be presenting on the reversion date and the cooperative work agreement. Next slide, please, Peter. Reversion date. Um, the final budget summary, uh, which also known as the Budget Act, has scheduled within each appropriation item um, in the Act indicating how long funding within each annual appropriation can spend from that particular year's Budget Act. So the budget build uh, language in the Budget Act, it explains how many years of authority each appropriations has to encumber and liquidate. So for most um, local assistance, state appropriations have six years to encumber and liquidate, but some projects may receive less than six years. The funds always lapse on um, June 30th for all appropriation item. In the example here, um, I provided projects encumber in the fiscal year 2020-2021, uh, counting the six years from 2021, you will arrive um, at the reversion date of June 30th, 2026. This um, will be the date that the funds will lapse. Okay, next slide, please. For, um, for C, uh, projects allocated by CTC, the reversion date is established based on the fiscal year from which the allocation is made against. In some instances, um, CTC allocated projects may receive budget authority from a prior fiscal year when going through the CTC uh, vote process. Um, the divisions of budgets does this in order to use the prior year authority first. So you may sometimes in the situations um, of having a five years to encumber and liquidate instead of six years. But the cooperative work agreements um, process will allow for additional two years to encumber and liquidate, which I will talk about the CWA um, later in my presentations. For CTC allocated projects, um, the funds um, also lapse on June 30th. Um, in the Example here, I provided projects that are assigned under budget year 2019 and 2020. Uh, counting from 2020, um, counting the six years from 2020, you will arrive um, at a reversion date of June 30th, 2025. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, for um, here is an example of the CTC vote box. For CTC allocated projects, you um, can find the budget year assigned to the projects on the CTC vote box. And um, here is the example that I provided earlier um, in my previous slide um, that this for this projects, um, the budget year assigned is 2019-2020. Next slide, please. Uh, here's an example of the uh, finance letter. Um, earlier in Peter's presentations, he also showed um, an example of the finance letter, which showed the uh, project end date. On the finance letter, um, it also showed the reversion date uh, at the bottom of the finance letter under the accounting information. So the finance letter is sent to the local agency. Um, the local agency will be able to see um, the reversion date for the funds. And as I mentioned before, the funds lapse on June 30th, uh, but the final invoice uh, needs to be submitted to the district by April 1st. Um, so it will leave enough time for uh, accounting and um, districts to process the invoice because the uh, invoice processing, um, the invoice process 
it goes through several touch points within the department. By submitting it um, on April 1st, it will allow us a sufficient time to process the invoice. If the agency can't submit the invoice on April 1st, uh, we highly recommend um, to request for a CWA to extend the reversion date um, because the CWA will allow for a two years extensions. I will go over the CWA in the next few slides. Next slide, please. Cooperative work agreement allowed by the government code 16304.3. Projects can be offered um, additional two years to expend the invoice. This is a one-time extension only. And this process is vet, uh, was vetted by the Department of Finance, the Division of Budgets, Local Assistance, and the State Controller Office. Uh, in the government code, uh, it stated funds are to revert to the fund of origins if they have not liquidated by the two additional years that was allowed by the CWA process. Next slide, please. Uh, you want to bear in mind that the timely use of fund uh, provisions might be shorter than what is allowed to be expended by the Budget Act. So for STIPS, ATP, um, SB1 projects uh, may be more restrictive and not allow um, as long of a timeline to for spending. Uh, sometimes you may need to request um, a timely use of fund extensions from the CTC before going through the CWA process. If the um, timely use of an extensions is approved by the CTC and the date goes beyond the reversion date, a CWA is needed to um, for expenditures. So sometimes you will need to request both. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, please note, uh, invoice need to be submitted by um, April 1st to the districts. Um, as I mentioned before, this is to allow sufficient time for review um, of invoice by the district's local program accounting and the state controller office. Next slide, please. So when, um, is, when does the CWA process start? CWA starts in December and is in, in March. Here are um, the timelines for the CWA. In the third week of December, um, the district local assistant engineer and the impacted agency will receive a list of projects that are eligible for CWA extensions. And the list will also be posted on the CWA webpage. And in the second week of January, the local agency or the program managers need to submit a justifications on all of the projects that request for CWA. And in late January, the headquarters subvention management branch will review the justifications um, submitted by the local agency. And then um, the request will be submitted to the division of budgets for review. Um, after the Division of Budgets review the request, um, they, then they will move it on to the Department of Finance. The Department of Finance will be um, the final department to make the decisions whether to approve or deny their uh, CWA request. Next slide, please. Okay. So in the second week of March, um, local agency will be informed of the CWA results. And the results will also be posted on the CWA webpage. Um, and um, the, for projects that receive a CWA um, extensions, we will enter the new reversion date into our database. Um, and a list of the proof CWA will be sent to the local program accounting and the state controller office. So when accounting receive an invoice from the agency, they will be able to pay the invoice. With the extension. Okay. In um, this slide here, I provided a link to the CWA webpage um, for more information on the CWA. So this is the end of my presentations uh, on reversion date and CWA. 
if you have any further questions, um, you are you can send an email to cwa.support at dot.ca.gov. I will have Carmen enter this uh, email address in the chat. If we miss any questions in the Q&A uh, or if you have further questions later, um, you can email us. And uh, now I'm gonna hand it over to Peter to um, present on the time we use the fund. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, had to unmute myself. Time use of funds. Um, the oops. time use of funds is um, has been established typically under CTC program guidelines for each of the programs. These are apply the time use of funds apply to the projects that the CTC allocates funds to. And emphasize these dates typically are more restrictive than like the reversion dates that Amy has just got talking talking about. So, uh, so, so in terms of funds are available um, for allocation uh, in identified in a programming document, and they're eligible in that document. They're under federal a state fisc state fiscal year. And so the funds are available for allocation during that year. So when funds are not, whenever program funds are not allocated within the deadline, the project programming will be deleted. So you, when the CTC programs, the anticipation is that those funds will be allocated. Uh, funds allocated for, allocated under basically um, four different areas. PA and ED, PS and E right away, construction. We'll also talk about PPM, which is planning, programming, monitoring, um, are a little bit different. They're thing, but those, those first three, and along with PPM, they must be must be expended. So you get your allocation, but then they must be expended by the end of the second fiscal year following the fiscal year which the funds were allocated. We are currently in state fiscal year of 21-22. So those funds will be available until June 30th of 2024. So funds allocated for construction must be awarded within six months of the allocation. That's another time of use requirement. So there's a tight time frame regards to getting an allocation and then moving forward to getting it to award. And understand that if there are federal funds involved with this, you also have to get the E76 approved. And it's highly recommended that you submit your allocation request. You also submit your authorization request at the same time. We cannot process the authorization until the, e until the funds have been allocated, but allows us to do the review to ensure that everything is, is correct and that once the allocation has occurred, we can process the E76 immediately after the allocation to avoid any delay on that part. Uh, after award on the construction, the local, Cal, local agency or Caltrans, can be a Caltrans product, you have 36 months to complete the contract. And local agencies must then submit final invoice for every within 180 days, counted from this specific phase's expenditure deadline or completion deadline. So these are these are deadlines. These are all set established by CTC guidelines. Here's the key: is of course it's extensions. We can get extensions, typically a one-time extension for each phase. So CTC may extend a delivery deadline upon request, but no deadline may be extended more than once. Each program and project component has its own deadline. So we have a separate for an allocation, contract award, expenditures, and project completion. As I mentioned, if a project is, pro pro is programmed in a certain fiscal year, 
you can request an extension before the fiscal year ends to get that moved out. But you need to get it done before during the fiscal year. STIP projects, like I said CTC may grant an extension up to 20 months for each deadline. Each of the deadlines I mentioned prior, you have, they can get up to 20 months. The ATP, SB1 programs of L, LPP, TCEP, S, SCCP, they have different. CTC may approve an extension up to 12 months. There are two exemptions. ATP, the allocation may receive an extension up to 20 months. The SB1 project completion may receive an extension up to 20 months. So just some, some uh, variations or just little slight subtleties for the different programs that we're talking about. And then time of use of funds. The reversion date I mentioned here again, typically the time use of fund requirements are more restrictive than reversion dates. And such that the reversion date is approximately five to six years after uh, when the phase is allocated, we're talking much shorter period of time. So if a time of use of extension is granted, then you'll need to compare it to the reversion to Determine, determine if a CWA will be needed. So, so once you get that extension, then you have to start ensuring that you don't need to, go, you're gonna have a reversion date issue. So again, here we're talking about time use of funds on our finance letters. As Amy pointed out, we have the reversion date, but we do put on here in our, projects we say refer to the CTC guidelines just a re reminder that the time use of funds provisions can uh, supersede the um, the reversion date so just something to be aware of and that we try to remind everyone with our finance letters of this issue with that I'm going to pass this on to uh, Robert Peterson, I believe, is going to be talking about, will be on for HSIP and for the bridge program. Robert, just let me know when you need to change the slides and I will be monitoring it here. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Can you hear me? All right. I can. Uh, you can hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm on a different um, IT device here, so I just want to make sure. So yeah, for the uh, the HSIP program, um, we have uh, established by policy. It's it's not a uh, a federal requirement, but we've uh, to as you know with HSIP, we would like to uh, program projects, get projects going, and getting them delivered. So we've established some uh, requirements um, within the project, uh, the program itself. And so there's the link. Um, uh, you can see all this information on our on our website. <clears throat> Go ahead. Next slide. So for HSIP, um, the, the two things that we really are um, looking at is, is the, the PE milestone. We really want to get the projects as soon as the call happens and as soon as we uh, get the agency, tell them that they've been awarded. Usually it's around the first of the year. Um, we ask for that they get their uh, project uh, funding for their PE achieved within nine months after the projects has been funding uh, funded. And, um, and, and so that's the first milestone. And then the second one that we track is after the project has been selected, we uh, we ask the agency to get the project uh, three years after the project has been selected. And if you have a consultant, um, it's three and a half um, if a consultant is hired for the PE. And so a lot of times what will happen is um, if in the application, 
a lot of times the agencies will put funding in for the PE and put funding in for con, but then after they start into the program or into their project, excuse me, um, we will see that they did not meet their PE. And so then we will reach out to that agency and say, Hey, you haven't reached out. And then they'll come back and say, Oh, by the way, we're reusing our own funds uh, for PE and we will put our funding all towards con which is perfectly fine, but a lot of times we, and we just need to know that. And so then we'll flag that into our, uh, into our delay list, uh, or then, then your, uh, that agency will then be taken off uh, the delay, de delay list for that uh, project. So, um, and so it's also the, the same for the con, um, or for the, for the con milestone. Uh, so as soon as uh, if you've not reached con, and this is basically submitting uh, your um, RFA to the district within the three years, then it'll get flagged um, for that. Um, and, and of course, now that we've uh, in this last cycle, um, they're state funded uh, for HSIP. And so it'll be the funding allocation and not the E76. Okay, next slide. So if the agency uh, if a project fails to meet the delivery requirements, uh, the local agency will not be eligible to submit a new project application until the delivery issue is resolved. And then the other one is uh, we really, then we've got a, a, a within five years. So you might be beyond the three and get the, um, and get a, um, a flag. Um, but if you don't deliver within five, that's when you start having other steps. A project may be dropped. We don't like to drop projects, um, but basically the, what the rules is, if you don't deliver within five, the project may be dropped and expended uh, HCF funds for earlier phases uh, to be paid back. Um, that is, of course, the, um, um, that's a direct draconian method. We don't like to do that, um, but we are providing a, a one-time exception that you can uh, provide an exception um, to go ahead and get uh, a new delivery date. But if it's beyond the five years, then uh, the requirement is you need to come to our local uh, HSIP advisory group to get that approval um, if it's beyond the five. And so once that approval has been given and then we require a quarterly or I think a semi every six month update of where you're at with, the, with that project. Um, we still got a handful that are in that uh, in that umbrella, but um, what we're seeing is the, these requirements have definitely helped out uh, with the delivery and getting projects off the books. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, for the Highway Bridge Program, um, this is the um, the website uh, to look at your project status summaries. Um, as you can imagine, the the bridge program is not like the ASIP. Um, the bridge program really, um, you know, we don't have the, the, the three years and the five years, uh, the bridge program is a little different, but one of the things that we do have is, uh, let's go to the next slide, is really uh, delivering, uh, getting your funding um, for the year that you've asked for it. And so we ask agencies to divorce to avoid your delivery failure for those funds that you've asked for in that year for that federal fiscal year that you can come in uh, for your uh, submit your RFA to notify uh, the DLA of the end, you know, submit your RFA or notify DLA of your anticipated project delay by, uh, by February fund, uh, February 1st of that year. And so if you do that, then you will be guaranteed that that funding that we reserve for you for that fiscal year, um, uh, it's, it's there for you. It's waiting, it's reserved, um, and, and it's ready to be, um, to, to be obligated. <clears throat> so if you failure to deliver uh, the right of way or construction phase as programmed, the phase will be moved to the last fiscal year of the FSTIP and we'll require to wait until the uh, April 1st to advance the funding. So what that means is, um, Funding will be there as long as, because really it's kind of a free for all, as you know, at the end of the federal fiscal year, because we want to obligate all the funds available for the bridge program. Um, so the penalty is we've, we've reserved the funds for you. 
Uh, if you fail to come in, therefore it'll it'll get it'll get pushed out in the last fiscal year, but then uh, you'll have to compete with other agencies and you may not get your funding um, because uh, you didn't come in on a timely fashion. Um, next slide. So that's it for the really the, the dates that you need for HSIP and uh, the Highway Bridge Program. And I will turn it over to, I think, Bob Baca, talk about the ER program. Bob? Thank you, Robert. Good morning. My name is Bob Baca, and I'm the Emergency Relief and Other Federal Programs Manager. Uh, let's take a few moments to talk about critical dates for the Emergency Relief or uh, ER program. Next slide, please. ER time extensions to important program deadlines require a significant amount of time and effort for local agencies, Caltrans districts and headquarters, as well as FHWA. However, with special attention to a few critical dates, it's possible to reduce the required effort by anticipating and gathering needed supporting documentation, if not eliminate the need for a time extension altogether by meeting the deadline. So first, it's important to note critical ER deadline dates are measured from the beginning date of the specific disaster. Okay, so how do you tell the begin date of a disaster? The begin date for every proclaimed disaster is in the official governor's disaster proclamation or US president's disaster declaration. Okay, so now that we know where to find a the begin date for a disaster, let's talk about the deadlines. Two of the most important critical deadlines to know for the ER program are, first, the damage assessment form submittal package deadline. Damage assessment forms also referred to as the DAF, D-A-F. So we, that's the first one. And the second one is the construction authorization deadline, also known as the E-76 CON, C-O-N deadline. So the damage assessment form, submittal package deadline, the DAF uh, submittal package is essentially the application for ER project funding approval from FHWA. It includes the scope and cost of the project as well as other things that are important to, to have to get FHWA approval. The complete DAF submittal package is due to the DLAE three months after the month of the disaster begin date. So as you'll recall, the disaster begin date is the date found in the uh, disaster proclamation. Okay, so that's the damage assessment form or DAF submittal package deadline. Okay, so now let's talk about the second one, the construction authorization deadline. So construction authorization is the formal project approval to begin reimbursable work on a phase or phases of a project. So the deadline is two federal fiscal years after the federal fiscal year of the disaster begin date. Again, we have the disaster begin date, so that proclamation is very important. As a reminder, FHWA began the, I'm sorry, the federal fiscal year begins on October 1st and goes to September 30th of the next calendar year. And so that's what a federal fiscal year is and how the uh, uh, deadlines are measured. Okay, the deadline is for construction authorization. So that means it's to have FHWA approval to proceed with the construction phase of work. And this is identified on a document that usually in the old days had E76 on top of the document because it was an old DOS program. So it's referred to as the E76 CON, standing for construction uh, document. Okay, do note that the deadline is not to advertise for construction and it's not to begin construction or complete construction. It's to have approval from FHWA to begin construction, the construction phase of work. Okay, so allow me to provide a very quick 
example of uh, these deadlines and how how they're calculated. So let's say a disaster proclaimed by the governor begins on August 21st of this year, 2021. So going three months after the month of the disaster begin date, the DAF submittal deadline to the DLAE, and that's the complete package, complete DAF package is November 30th, 2021. And the E76 construction deadline or the deadline to have approval from FHWA to begin construction work is September 30th of 2023. On a final note, although it is possible to request and receive a time extension to both the ER DAF and E76 construction authorization deadlines, uh, do keep in mind FHWA approval of, your, of these requests are certainly not uh, guaranteed and we've had uh, denials in the past. So if at all possible, uh, you want to meet these deadlines or at least uh, document, gather documentation so that you're prepared to have a strong uh, request for uh, time extension. And with that, I will now turn the time over to our next presenter. Thank you so much, Bob. My name is Daniel Burke with the Division of Local Assistance here at headquarters in the Office of Guidance and Oversight. We're talking about the single audit report today. Next slide, please, Peter. <clears throat> so the first question we need to ask ourselves is, is my agency subject to the single audit report requirement? Yes, if the total federal funds that you have expended is greater or equal to $750,000 in a fiscal year. So this just doesn't mean Caltrans or California Department of Transportation federal funds. We're talking about other federal funds as well, mm -hmm. such as those from the Federal Housing and Urban Development, Health and Human Services. So again, it's in totality if the federal funds expended are greater or equal to $750,000 in the federal fiscal year. So therefore, your year-to-year -year eligibility of whether you are required to comply with the single audit report requirement may vary based on your agency's total federal expenditures. So Daniel, what happens if my agency is exempt and we don't need to comply with the single audit report requirement for this fiscal year? Well, your agency will need to place on an agency letterhead that's and write us a letter that states, the exempt fiscal year, why your agency is exempt, so certified exemption reason, and have an authorizing signature, and you'll need to email that letter to the state controller's office. There's the email address there on the screen for you, and also to Caltrans, and there's an email provided as well. Uh, next slide, please, Peter. So now that we're, we've determined that your agency is <clears throat> required to comply with the single audit report requirement, what is included in the single audit report package? So we have various items that are included in the package here. I'm only gonna go through a couple today. We need the independent auditors report. That's where your independent auditor, so your, your agency is gonna go out and hire an independent certified public accountant. That's where they're gonna weigh in on your agency's overall well-being and ability to manage federal funding. So they'll have to sign off on a generalized report. Another item I want to talk about is schedule of expenditures of federal awards. That's where you'll put in each of the federal awards and how much your agency has expended within each fiscal year, or rather the fiscal year that the single audit report applies to. Also included will be a schedule of findings and question costs if your independent CPA determined there were findings and question costs any corrective actions. So your agency will need to address those findings and question costs before your independent CPA finalizes the single audit report. And any prior findings that might be open uh, that have not been corrected. Next slide, please, Peter. So great, so now we know it constitutes a single audit report. We've talked about how each agency may be eligible to 
or be required to comply with the single audit report requirement? When is it due and where do I send it to? The SAR single audit report is due within the earlier of 30 days after the independent auditor signs the single audit report or nine months from the end of the fiscal year. About, oh, I'd say 80 to 90% of California's agencies have the same fiscal year as the state of California or Caltrans, which begins on July 1st, ends on June 30th. So if we're talking about the fiscal year ending on June 30th, 2021, the majority of agencies would need to submit the single audit report at the very latest by March 31st, 2022. And the single audit report package is uploaded to the federal clearinghouse. And there's the website where you upload it. You'll need to put in, you'll need to request and uh, register and develop a username and password and hold on to the pin that the federal automated clearinghouse sends out to you. You'll need to send it to SDO and there's uploading instructions and email addresses identified there for the state controller's office or SDO's <clears throat> website. And then you'll also need to send a copy to Caltrans as well. Next slide, please, Peter. So we now have a better understanding of what's required within the single audit report. How is Caltrans going to assist our local partners? We send out courtesy emails for the single audit report package and for the exemption letter. Each December, we'll send out a reminder letter to our agencies. We have a list of financial managers throughout all of the agencies or most of them. And we'll put in there basically the requirements where you send the single audit report package to, which we just saw on the previous slide also, what you need to, the, the exemption letter that you need to construct, which we talked about earlier in there. So we have the full instructions and also what is constituted within the single audit report package, which we also discussed a couple of slides ago. In addition, we'll also follow up in about April or May and just issue a warning letter if we have not received and the state controller's office has not received a copy of the single audit report package. The single, uh, excuse me, the state controller's office has a website and a listing of those agencies that have complied with the single audit report, either through submitting a single audit report package or if they have not submitted a single, uh, excuse me, an exemption letter for the single audit report. So based on that letter, we, we go ahead and indicate and send out emails to the, the impacted agencies and let them know, hey, we haven't received your single audit report. Uh, you need to go ahead and either submit the single audit report package or an exemption letter. So what happens if agencies do not submit the single audit report package or the exemption letter? This is where the bad news lies in. You know, we, we as far as Caltrans, we really try to assist our local partners. We want to see them succeed. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's really difficult for us to provide our oversight without being able to ensure that an independent certified public accountant has reviewed your agency's financial controls to administer federal funds. So we really need to see and verify that that oversight has occurred and your financials have been reviewed. What will end up happening is if we don't receive the exemption letter or the single audit report package within about three months after the warning letter is sent out, we may sanction the agency to include no future state federal authorizations. And these are no new future state and federal authorizations until the SAR package or the exemption letter is received. And once we receive those, we'll, we'll go ahead and remove your agency from the list. So it's a really easy fix on our end. I believe that brings me to the end of my presentation. And I'm going to turn things back over to Neil. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, we have a little bit more time uh, before we wrap up this session um, with a, um, a the quiz uh, that we did earlier. Felicia walked us through. Um, it looks like uh, my count, we got about 20 minutes. Um, so, Robert. Um, it looks like we have some questions regarding the HSIP program. Um, if we all open up the question and answer window, we can see a, a question by Ying Smith at 1043. 
can you elaborate on allocating only no E76 required for HSIP projects funded by state state funds only? Robert, can you feel that one for us? Uh, yes. So if I if I got the question right, so when we started cycle 10, um, cycle 10 is state only funds. That means from beginning to end, there will not be one dollar, one dollar of federal funds that, that will be put on there. Oop. So so yeah, there won't be uh, so you, so it, the process is different and it's on our website. Um, but it's like a state uh, allocation. Uh, so that's not an E76 because it's not going to the FHWA for approval. Um, and so I think I've, I hope I've answered that question. If not, right. ask again. Um, yeah, let's just keep rolling through them. Again, we got another 20 minutes to, to respond to these questions to the best of our ability. As usual, if we can't get to them to because of time, we will provide written responses in the follow-up. So Robert, the next one is uh, the HSIP presentation you mentioned, the option to move all PE funds into the construction phase. If an agency chooses to do that, wouldn't they still need to engage local assistance to attain NEPA clearance and right-of-way certification before construction authorization? Yes, that's that's true. The, it, it's just let us know, uh, let DLAE know and, and or your, uh, yeah, your local, uh, local assistance engineer and, and us know that you intended to use your local funds uh, to uh, get your PE completed. Um, and yes, yeah, so all that's the, the, so the requirements have not changed. It's just that now you're saying you want all your funds that you've asked for to be used for construction. Uh, so let us know and then we will then make that change uh, happen to where we'll move all the funds into, into the con um, into the con bucket, construction bucket. <clears throat> and it, Robert, it looks like the next series of questions are, are really for your um, section of the presentation. Would you mind continuing to scroll through and, and see which questions you might be able to field? You know, I, I, I can't, let me see. I'm on my iPad, so I don't know if I can see all the chat. Let me well, see, oh, there, we let's, there, let's we are, there we are, there we are, there we are. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna read them out for you. So this is the team effort, right? <laughs> okay, how do um, these new dates work with the HBP changes? If my funds are moved to 2023 slash 2024, what now? So, um, yeah, so when it comes to, uh, you mean as far as the the, the, the actual funds themselves and moving it to another fiscal year? Um, as with a lot of questions, there's a little bit of context that might be missing. So let's just do our best to field it as best we can. Okay. Yeah, we don't, with our funding, uh, we don't, um, you know, we don't, we don't go to the CTC and the CT, the CTC is very strict. Uh, you use the funds that you, um, that you uh, get allocated for. Uh, since we do a lump sum, uh, we do a lump sum uh, funding uh, exchange, we have a bucket of money that we then allocate funding out to the, to the agencies. So really the only thing that you need is uh, to make sure you expend it within the six years. Um, so it doesn't matter um, when you're gonna ask for that, those funds. Um, so even though you, you, you have your fiscal years that you've asked for those funds, um, really the only requirement you need to be looking for is making sure you deliver uh, within our, you know, the nine months for the, for this, for the PE and then the three years for the, um, um, three years for the, uh, the con, um, you can always, always EPSP or ask for your funds earlier to get your project started. Uh, so we have that flexibility and with it being state only funds, um, they're really, you know, really the only restrictions is once you get your funding allocated uh, that you have six years to expend those funds. Uh, so it's much more flexible. <clears throat> 
and then I'll give a stab at the answer to the next question because I think you just answered it. So I'll try a little reflective listening here, make sure I heard your answer correctly. For the HSIP program, what is the process to notify Caltrans if the local agency decides to use local funds for PE instead of awarded federal funds um, and would like to use those federal PE funds to construction? I think I heard your answer was contact your district DLAE. Is that the correct answer? Yes. Very good. Any additional texture you want to add to that? Or is that pretty much the bottom line? The DLA will walk you through it. Yes. All right. Very yeah, good. Okay. Um, next question is, um, we're looking for additional programming dates for HSIP and HPP. Where can we find all programming dates? Um, for HSIP, like I said, basically once you, um, I, I can't speak for ATP. Um, so I, I couldn't answer that, but for the, um, but for the HSIP, um, when you, when you submit your application, those dates are put into our database. Um, and in the, in the FTIP world, then we would have put those into the FTIP and we would have put in your project and we, and we don't do it by phase. When we program in the FTIP, like I said, we're doing it different now because now we're state only. Um, but with, with, with the FTIP, we basically put all funds in the outer, outer years because um, we don't program by phase. It's just if we did that, it would, it would, it would be very difficult to, main, to try to uh, manage our funds. And so uh, in the past with the, with the federal only, um, we put it in the outer fiscal year, let's say the last uh, year of the fiscal year. And then if you want so much funding, uh, to get started and then how much funding you would ask for PE, then we would move that forward through the EPSP process, uh, how much funding you would need. Um, but with, when it comes to the state portion uh, allocation, the state funded, um, you really don't need to ask for an EPSP because we don't fund it in the FTIP. Uh, we basically have got that approval to do a lump sum um, transfer of funds to say cash and then we do an allocation request um, that it should be on our website with the allocation, uh, how much funding you need for PE. Very good. Uh, next question. If projects are reviewed every other year for HBP, which year does it begin on? For the highway bridge program? Yeah, again, a lot of these, the better, the better job we do of focusing the question, the better job we can do at answering it. The, as written, <laughs> so, it is if projects are reviewed every other year for HBP, which year does it begin on? Uh, yeah, we, with, for the highway bridge program, um, basically, like, um, it'll, this next fiscal year, so if, for the, for the date that I was talking about, that's every federal fiscal year. So every federal fiscal year, funds get, um, get programmed. Uh, so right now we're gonna be doing an October, uh, an October run of funding. Um, and, so, uh, and so then soon after that, agencies will be notified depending on the survey information of which funding, which projects get which funding. Uh, de depending on if it's going to be PE right away or, con or construction. And so then soon after that, agencies will be notified that, that they need uh, get uh, uh, their, their project is programmed this year. They need to be coming in by February 1 for that funding. Um, as far as new projects getting into the program, um, it's basically um, at, right before the FTIP. So when the FTIP gets developed, and I'm, and I'm not sure the date, I think this year is, um, I, th I think we'll be looking at March of, of next year as far as whether we have funding available and to see if we can start getting projects uh, with for the next FTIP. And, and, but that's another, uh, you know, that's another area that I'm not, too familiar with right now, I, I can't speak on it, but really the critical thing you need to remember is if you've been notified that you've gotten funding for that year to come in for that funding for that fiscal year uh, that we, my managers have reserved for you. <clears throat> That's great. It looks like we have Desiree um, trying to type out an answer in regards to state funded HSIP and ATP. So um, let's go ahead and go to the next one for you. Um, if with HSIP state funds, um, do you still require 
FAR rates, F-A-R rates for staff with ICR approval over approved overhead rates? If it's state funded, um, and that's a good question. Um, but if it's basically the, the what we're trying to do is if it's state funds, it really has to abide by state, uh, the state programming. If it's a federal requirement, um, then then that's, I guess the answer is no. Um, if it's something that the feds are, or, or if it's a federal requirement because they are state funded, uh, those, those would not be uh, required. But then again, now you're dealing with an area I'm not too familiar with. Um, as far as the difference. Um, but I do know that, you know, if it's a, if it's, it's a state funded, uh, you all you need to do is do a CEQA, since you're CEQA lead, you'll just need to do a CEQA for your environmental approval. Uh, all the other ones, uh, for the other requirements, I would work with your uh, DLAE uh, specifically for those uh, answers. Good. I'm not sure who might be the best to field this one. So open to all of our subject matter experts. What is the deadline for submitting an exhibit 6D to the DLAE for next federal fiscal year funding? Uh, that's me. Uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 6D is you're changing. Um, yeah, you're changing costs and scope. I think changes costs and scope, but any changes um, you really need to be um, letting letting us know the change in your in your project. Um, a lot of times, a lot of times, um, funding will be held up if we don't get an approval uh, approved six D uh, for a project. Um, so yeah, I would say um, treat those separately, but as soon as possible, so uh, so they're not a hold up. Um, when you ask for those funds. Uh, the next question seems a little bit similar to the ones that we talked about earlier about reallocating uh, funds between phases, um, if I'm reading it right. Um, it, we have an HSIP project where we use federal HSIP funds for PE, and we have a tiny amount of HSIP funds for construction. We do not want to use the HSIP funds for construction. How do we go about de-obligating the HSIP construction funds? Are there any ramifications for doing this? Maybe that's a little bit different. This is yeah, I, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess my question is why would you need to just go ahead and use the remaining funds um, and, and get that federal reimbursement for the remainder and then and then use your local funds? Um, I mean, you can you can de-obligate it, but my, I guess my question is, why would you, if you've already got it uh, sitting there um, and you can get reimbursement uh, easily for that? This is Peter. I can add a little bit onto that. Um, sure. You know, it may be that um, for uh, administering the contract, okay. they don't want to follow all the federal requirements. So therefore, utilizing local funds gives them a lot more flexibility in administering the construction contract and hiring a consultant. So okay. if, they, if they if they were to have that, all it would be is submitting a E76 to deobligate any funds that were authorized under construction. Peter, uh, follow up based on something put into the chat. Uh, once you use federal funds for PE, it's all federalized. Well, uh, that's not completely accurate. It, there's basically three requirements. Um, if you use one dollar federal funds, one that means you have to fall under NEPA. I mean, you have to do NEPA no matter what. As soon as you put one dollar of funds there, and under right away, it's um, oh geez, I got to think of what the term is. Under right away has a requirement. Um, I just, the, the phrase slipping my mind at the moment, I'm sorry, I can't come up with it. Um, and the third requirement is by American. And that is that your iron and steel has to be American manufactured. Those are the only three requirements. So if you authorize PE with federal funds, you can still do the construction with non-federal funds. 
but you still have, like I said, you, you'd still have to meet the Buy American requirement as a component of that. Okay, very good. Um, it looks like that is the majority of the questions in the Q&A. Um, it looks like we got another one just came in. An FTIP document, in the FTIP document, construction funds to be programmed in various fiscal year if construction is multi-year project or to program all construction funds in the first year of, in the first fiscal year of the construction year? Um. I've seen that. Um, typically, yeah, that's for some larger projects, but when we do the authorization, um, a lot of times what we'll use is advanced construction for the balance because we need to show a fully funded project when we do the authorization and go to con and go to construction. So advanced construction can be used and then we piecemeal as we go along, particularly on the bridge side of things, because I know you can get some large bridge projects and we don't want to tie up all the all the obligation um, or the apportionments on a project that we know will be over multiple years. So it, it, we do it um, and it's not not you know it's not rare, but it, you know typically it would be showing that, like I said, in the bridge database, for example, they would show multiple years with the idea that that they'll use a cash flow methodology for getting the authorizations done over multiple cycles. Very good. Um, Sherry, can we unmute Dawn? She might have something to add on this subject. I'm going to stop sharing. I think I'm unmuted. I don't know if you can good. hear me Go now. Jump but on yes. In. So generally, uh, federal programming requirements, you're going to want to consult your metropolitan planning organization or your RTPA who's who's handling your tip because I mean that the question is pretty broad. So depending on the funding type, how long generally you're going to program your funds in the year that they're going to get obligated if they're federal funds, unless you're using AC. And even if you're using AC, you need to show the funds in the fiscal year that you're obligating and you need to program it as advanced construction with conversion. So the best place to uh, check in for those programming requirements is with your MPO or your RTPA. Um, and so all the local jur jurisdictions have somebody that they work with, whether they go directly to Caltrans because they're not in an MPO area or uh, you know, through their RTPA or CTC. So that's a good place to start because the question really depends on the funds being used for a project. Thank you. Great point, Don. Um, Felicia, let's go ahead and pull up our wrap up quiz um, for segment two of dates and deadlines. Um, while Felicia does that, um, I definitely want to echo the importance of the ongoing relationship between our local and city county agencies and their RTPO and MP, uh, MPO uh, counterparts. So very, very critical um, uh, set of resources that they have to provide for you. Great. Okay. Felicia Haslam here again. Five quick questions. Um, let's talk about reversion dates. The poll is up on your screen. Again, give you 10 to 15 seconds. On which document is the reversion date found? Is it on the E76, on the finance letter, in the program supplement agreement? There is no such thing as a reversion date. So I just wanna say reversion date is one of our um, critical dates that agencies uh, confuse with maybe timely use of funds. So we wanna make sure that agencies do understand the reversion date goes with the state budget authority. So let's see how we did on the finance letter um, was the majority. Yes, so the reversion date is the state budget authority. It is not linked to your E76, not federal funds. Um, although you have to comply with it, it's not a federal requirement to state budget authorities. So it is on the finance letter. The program supplement agreement has um, verbiage in there on the reversion date and what it is, but the actual date is found on the finance letter. This is very different than timely use of funds. All right, next question. Reversion date expiration. So again, on your finance letter for each funding, uh, the program codes will have the reversion dates. And um, if you're gonna request funding for any of those 
different types of funding, then you need to make sure it falls within the reversion date. But what happens if your reversion date is going to expire? And yes, we do expect you to track this date. And um, we are working on ways to help with all these dates because we realize there's a lot of dates. We do this for a living and there's a lot of dates to us can be confusing. So we know it's confusing for you as well. But what happens if your reversion date is nearing expiration? Um, what would you need? A cooperative work agreement, a new E76, or to get a salad at lunch? And we all know we need a salad at lunch, but that's not the choice I usually take. <clears throat> yes, a cooperative work agreement. Again, that extends your um, the encumbrance authority for two years. So if your reversion date's nearing, please reach out. And um, we also reach out and say, hey, your um, funding is nearing. Need a cooperative work agreement. Again, not E76. That's a different, um, different type of, of deadline. Next question. Timely use of funds. So a timely use of fund is usually the most restrictive deadline on a project, applies to projects with CTC allocated, allocated state and federal funds, doesn't apply if federal funds are on an ATP SB1 project, answers A and B. All right, answers A and B for sure, um, although A, um, a is definitely true. It is the most restrictive deadline normally on a project. So please make sure you read your allocation letters because it will have that um, those time frames, six months to award for construction, right? If you pass that time frame, you're kind of um, you're kind of stuck because those deadlines are very strict. CTC is very strict. We do not control those dates. That is set by the CTC. We cannot change that. So um, we want to make sure that agencies understand your timely use of funds if you have CTC allocated funds. If it goes to the CTC, um, federal and state, if you have federal funds on your project, if it's allocated through um, with state funds through the CTC, you have to apply with both deadlines, um, all deadlines for state and federal. So again, if it goes through the CTC, you have to abide by the timely use of funds deadlines. Um, make sure you understand what those are. Um, it absolutely applies even if you have um, federal funds on your CTC allocated project. If it's just federal funds, then you don't worry about time use of funds. But if it's on a state CTC allocated project, then you have to worry about it. So answers A and B. All right, next question. Emergency programs. So if an emergency happens in an agency, you're automatically eligible for funding. Is that, is that a true statement? Requires a declaration by the governor or US president must be eligible work and completed within the program deadlines, answers B and C. All right, I think that's a, maybe an easy one. Answers B and C. I try not to trick everyone, right? So um, just because an emergency happens doesn't mean it's automatically eligible. It does require a declaration and we get that question quite a bit in our trainings. Um, that does it need some type of declaration? Absolutely does by the governor or the president. Um, if it doesn't have that, it's not an emergency project and it must be the eligible work and completed within the program guidelines. So make sure you understand the program guidelines when you go for emergency uh, project. All the other deadlines apply as well, right? Because it's federal funds. So inactives, PE over 10, um, PED, all of those also apply um, with federal funds. All right, I think we have one more, one more question. This one's a little tougher. Hopefully you've been paying attention on the single audit report. Um, a single audit report is when, um, when is an agency subject to the single audit report requirements? If you expend um, at least $750,000 or more in total state and federal funds in a fiscal year, if you expend $750,000 or more in total federal funds in a fiscal year, or every agency that has a master agreement with Caltrans is subject to the requirement, or D, if an agency expends greater than or equal to $250,000 in total state and federal funds in a fiscal year. Okay, see how we did on that one. Yes, so B is the most common answer. It's if you expend $750,000 or more 
than total federal funds. So again, as Daniel mentioned, it's not just funds that flow through um, the Division of Local Assistance or Caltrans, it's all federal funds. So make sure that your agency is doing your single auto report um, because we are required to track that um, and follow up with agencies on that. So that's all I had on the quiz. Um, so I, I thank everyone for showing up and doing your part. And um, so we'll try to do our part as well and create the tools that you need um, to help you out with these projects. So thank you. That's awesome. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take uh, our final uh, 10 minute break um, for the day. We're gonna come back with Daniel covering ADA and Title VI requirements, um, give Kelly Hobbs, Office Chief for Environmental Compliance, a wrap up on environmental, the, the environmental process, managing our scoping and, and the critical path for environmental delivery. Um, Sherry, if you wouldn't mind putting on a timer, um, we'll be back here shortly. Please everybody uh, use the restroom, grab a cup of coffee or a glass of water and we'll see you in 10. Thank you.
All right, we are back again for the final stretch of today. Uh, Daniel, could you walk us through requirements and resources for the ADA and Title VI process? Hi, Neil, I sure can. Can everybody see my screen? We can see your screen and hear you just fine, thanks. Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> so it's really nice to see a couple of participants right up onto the Q&A screen and onto the Mentimeter to, to ask for, you know, resources and training with Americans with Disabilities Act and Title VI requirements and resources, which is great. We've just conducted both trainings and we have those requirements and resources available online for any time that an agency wishes to review those items. So I'm just going to briefly cover where to find those resources today. And so first off, what is the Americans with Disabilities Act? And I'm only gonna to touch base on it here just a little bit as far as it applies to transportation programs. So the key words to pull out of the text box here is prohibits discrimination on the basis of access to public services, public accommodations, commercial facilities, and transportation. So the federal government was way ahead of California in reacting to the term of equity, or in terms of equity, I should say. Back in 1972, the Americans with Disability Act or Title II was passed to remove barriers and give those individuals with disabilities accessibility to public services, accommodations, facilities such as parks, city halls, recreation areas that are publicly funded, and of course, transportation facilities. So that's the whole basis behind the ADA program is making sure that there's equal opportunities for individuals with disabilities. And so we come here to our next slide, which talks about some of the local public agency requirements. Local Assistance has developed a website here, and let's see if it pops up. There it is, very nice. <clears throat> which has basically all of the requirements for our subrecipients, or as we, we, we refer to them as our local public agencies. So on the site, you will find information such as the requirement of needing an ADA coordinator, and I'm only gonna go through these very briefly. Developing grievance procedures for ADA complaints and claims. The importance of having an ADA non-discrimination policy for all of our municipalities and local public agencies. Developing a self-evaluation plan that requires a plan to identify and potentially remove those barriers for individuals with disabilities. And then for those agencies with 50 or more employees total, and again, this just isn't your transportation department, but the whole entity or public agency itself is developing a transition plan to remove, fund, and schedule out those removals of those barriers to individuals with disabilities. And, you know, one of the main ones, one of the main parts of that that I think, you know, affects everybody universally, including Caltrans, is developing a curb ramp schedule, you know, to make sure that people can access streets, sidewalks, transportation facilities properly. And our contact below, our subject matter expert, her name is Kathy Lee. She works with me in the Division of Local Assistance, and there is her information there. And again, we'll have the presentation made available to everybody and have that website available as well. So as I mentioned, we recently developed and implemented an ADA administration training. So this is basically all of the administrative requirements or requirements rather that our local public agencies must contain such as those contained on the website. I'm just gonna walk you through our our training website here for the ADA program. So in April of 2021, we hosted an ADA administrative training. We have PDF versions of the slides. We have a Q&A session. We even have a little bit on design information uh, for designing some of those facilities, especially specifically curb ramps that apply to design Caltrans design information bulletin 
82. And those are those uh, those basically cover more the design and facilities aspect of it. And it, it provides a nice guidance too for for those agencies who are wanting to improve potentially improve upon their own procedures and uh, perform you know facility and curb ramp mitigation the Caltrans way. And we also have our hour and a half video on there, which I highly recommend as well. And like the meme up here says, but wait, there's more. We are partnering with our friends at the Federal Highway Administration. We're well, going to talk a little more in depth on the design and facilities requirements for the ADA program. We're going to host two sessions, one on September 21st to 22nd, and the second on September 28th to 29th. And the link to the LTAP where you may register for this training is listed here. So let's move on to that Title VI now that I've showed you how to access our subrecipient requirements and training for the ADA program. So what is Title VI? So Title VI came about through the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And again, this is a very equity-based law that was passed. It removes barriers to create equity and this is on the basis of race, color, national origin, and later on added to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the basis of disability, sex, and age. So again, we've worked really hard to place up some of the requirements or all of the requirements that local public agencies will need to have and maintain. We have the Federal Highway Administration Title VI Local Agency Requirements on this webpage right here. Again, it's all included in the presentation, which you will receive a copy of. It talks about the importance of having a Title VI coordinator, how to disseminate your Title VI information, and especially let people know, you know who attend city council or board of supervisors meetings, um, how to get information in another language, or if you'll require an interpreter. You'll need to have Title VI assurances and contract documents. That's one of the, the big items that we really need to have out there with our local pub, public agencies is to ensure that appendices A through E of the Title VI assurances are included on every construction contract and also on every consultant contract from between the local agency and their contractor that, hey, we're working on a federal project and that we're going to abide by Title VI. Each agency will need to develop its own Title VI training for local agency staff. We have a sample of training up there, how to process your data collection to, you know, ensure which particular, uh, excuse me, particular individuals may be subject, uh, may, may require the agency to implement Title VI provisions based on the area or neighborhood where you're going to be conducting a project. We also have the importance of developing an implementation program plan and why it's necessary to include Title VI accomplishments from the previous year and goals for the future year, which is just used internally within your agency. So these are not due to Caltrans, but these are goals and accomplishments for your agencies to monitor and track to ensure that you, know, you stay compliant with the Title VI program. And we also have Title VI complaint procedures as well. Similar to the ADA program, we also provided some Title VI training in February of 2021 here. So we have <clears throat> the PDF versions of the slides. We have several parts recorded. We have questions and answers from the training itself. And then we also have the Q&A documented. And again, you know, please speak with Kathy Lee. She's our subject matter expert, or you may always email myself. That is the end of my presentation. I'm going to turn things back over to Neil. All right, thank you. We are in the home stretch now. Um, Kelly, you have some essentials on the environmental process for us. Okay, let me get it up here. 
Okay, I'm hoping everybody can see that. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Kelly Hobbs. I'm the Office Chief for the Office of Environmental Compliance and Outreach. And we're gonna go over some environmental scoping and project management. Uh, we're gonna try to do some tips and tricks and do's and don'ts. And uh, we will uh, may not have any time for questions at the end, um, but we'll, we'll do our best. So with that, So environmental oversight at Caltrans for local assistance projects is uh, we cover NEPA compliance for off-system federal aid. Um, we are the NEPA lead agency under our NEPA assignment MOUs, and that's for US codes 326 and 327. Uh, 326 covers categorical exclusions. So smaller projects, which make up about 95 to 97% of our workload on the federal side and US Code 327, which covers large federal documents such as environmental assessments and environmental impact statements. Um, our guidance is found in the Standard Environmental Reference or the Caltrans SIR and um, Chapter 6 of the Local Assistance Procedures Manual, which covers all of the procedures that uh, we do here in local assistance that are not included in the general um, SIR reference. Um, the standard environmental reference covers the state highway system as well. Um, that's where Caltrans CEQA policies are, um, are housed. Um, in local assistance here for environmental, we, again, we only cover the National Environmental Policy Act. And I gotta go back, because, okay, all right. So as for the California Environmental Quality Act, um, Caltrans has little to no role in your CEQA process. Um, we cannot, by law, provide guidance for CEQA. Um, local agencies are responsible for all compliance with all state laws. Um, however, that being said, we can help. Um, we, we can provide, you know, our opinions on the CEQA process that you may have to follow through, but we cannot, by law, give formal direction on what you do. You can follow our templates um, on the CEQA side. You're not required to. Um, but all of our templates for the for NEPA are, are required to be followed. But just remember local agencies, you're responsible for compliance with all state laws. Also, you manage your consultants, um, you know, through our direction to complete all um, local assistance documentation for NEPA. And that stuff would be approved by Caltrans. So again, just to reemphasize, we have little or no role in the CEQA process. Um, you're responsible for compliance with state laws and um, you manage your consultants. However, um, you know, Caltrans, when it comes to NEPA, you know, we're right there with you at the table um, directing your consultants. Um, local assistance environmental staff work with the district local assistance engineer and their staff. And the DLAE is your primary contact, you know, to get through the door with environmental um, you know, there's a lot of, di there's 12 districts out there. Each district, you know, communicates with their local agencies in, a di you know, different ways. Um, you know, what goes on in district one might not be the same way they handle it down in district 11, but your DLAE, you know, at the statewide level, your DLAE is the primary contact um, when you start your process. Our environmental oversight begins with the submittal of the preliminary environmental study form. And that's going to, that's going to include your scope studies and the class of action. The class of action is the um, documentation of what type of project you're going to be doing, whether it's a categorical exclusion, environmental assessment, or environmental impact statement. Um, after PES approval, the NEPA process is consistent with the procedures found in the system. Um, that just means that wherever there's policy that we follow the general Caltrans practice on the state highway system, uh, that's going to be found in the SIR, and we will, um, the, the, the NEPA process is, is one thing where we, we follow it pretty much directly. The pre-NEPA and post-NEPA um, portions, we have more direct control over that process, um, so you're going to need to be familiar with both the standard environmental reference and the chapter six of the LAPM. So post-NEPA, 
uh, local agencies will design the project and work with state and federal agencies to to obtain all your permits out there. And that's regardless of, uh, again, that's, you will be responsible to, you're the permit applicant and um, you will be working with the, the resource agencies on that part of the process. Uh, again, for state and federal permit, for state agencies, we can, we can assist, we can't direct, um, but we can, you can invite us to the table when you're negotiating those permits. Um, and then all project, okay. And then during construction, we have a process called revalidation, which we will look for consistency um, with the environmental document that was completed for the project and to ensure that environmental commitments are included and completed. So that includes any mitigation or monitoring requirements that you have. And that will include state and federal as well as, or you know, state requirements as well. Um, even though we're not lead agency for CEQA, FHWA will reimburse for CEQA related um, commitments so in mitigation, but that's a discussion that you'll have to have because CEQA related mitigation requires a discussion with the DLE and the senior environmental planner to ensure that, that the CEQA expenditures are reasonable expenditures of public funds. So, and finally for this slide, all project activities are subject to Caltrans and FHWA audit and monitoring. Um, we have monthly, quarterly, and annual re reporting requirements, and we have quarterly and annual um, monitoring process that, that our districts have to go through. So earlier in the presentation, I talked about our assignment of NEPA activities by through our 326 and 327 MOUs. We are required to ensure to FHWA U.S. Congress and others, state government, that we are performing our duties, um, you know, as as dictated by our MOUs. So there's a lot of auditing and monitoring that goes into the work that's done. So the next couple of slides, we can talk a little bit about um, uh, challenges and opportunities. And um, you know, this isn't an all-inclusive list. Um, there could be some more out there that um, you know pop up from time to time. The biggest challenge that we have is communication. And that's just making sure that, you know, we're following the process, we're, we're reporting back to our local partners. Um, you know, we do a great job telling you how and when to do a study, where to do the study. Um, a lot of times we might not tell you why. We, we don't do a good job telling you why we're doing it the way we're doing it, but it all goes back to our 326 and 327 MOUs and the agreements that we have with various state and federal agencies. So, you know, the opportunity here is to communicate with us early. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry. A lot of times issues could be solved with a simple phone call. Make sure environmental staff are inv invited to uh, field reviews, um, you know, check in on your projects. You know, if, if you have a deadline coming up on a project, you know, pick up the phone and, and talk to Caltrans and, and make sure that, you know, we're being responsive to your needs. Like I said, sometimes the biggest issues can be solved with simple, simple communication. Quality of environmental documentation, that's like, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. We, we don't control the, um, you know, we don't manage your consultants out there, but we direct, we direct the work. We need to make sure that the quality of the environmental documents is, is you know, it, doesn't necessarily have to be a doctoral dissertation, but it has to be a, you know, a top quality report. Um, and this is where we need you guys to do first line, first line reviews of the process or of the documents out there before it comes to us. Um, a really good thing to, to remember is since we aren't managing your consultants before they start their work, there should be a meeting with, with Caltrans to ensure that they're not doing more than they need to. Um, overanalyzing. Sometimes we get into analysis paralysis. We want to stay away from that. So make sure you're doing your first line reviews. And if there's any questions, going back to the last slide, you know, talk to Caltrans and we can help. Scheduling. This is a big, this is a big issue. We need to make sure on your PES form, when you start going through the process, we need to ensure that we have enough time to consult on higher um, level in environmental documents and that we put enough cushion in our schedules um, to handle consultation with resource agencies and stakeholders. This can be a big issue because 
on the next slide, I believe I show you some, some time frames that we have. And just because there might be a 15 or 30 day review, there still needs to be a cushion of time to get those reviews to the resource agencies and to allow for questions um, back. So making sure that you know we're not in the 11th hour of the 11th hour trying to deliver a project when you're scheduling your projects, make sure that we have you know, ample time to get our work done. Uh, working with resource agencies, if you have 95, uh, I said earlier about 95 to 97% of our projects are categorical exclusions. So the you know, minor, minor work, minor projects of minor complexity, um, you know, but bridge replacements and you know, widenings can all be included in a categorical exclusion depending on the impacts. Um, but working with resource agencies, we don't control, a lot of times we don't control their workload. We do have some agreements with Fish and Wildlife Service or with the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. We do some reimbursed uh, work agreements where we staff liaisons in those agencies to help. But if there's a 15 or 135 day review and there's, you know, we provided a four level quality document it could take more than that time. So going back, communication and quality control are the key. Um, make sure you start early and, and Caltrans is engaged and we can get through that process. So here we show some, some time frames. So uh, again, going back to you know, how much time agencies have to review a, pro a project. So with US Fish and Wildlife or, or NIMFS, you know, they have, for formal and informal consultation, anywhere from 30 to 135 days. That 135 days is generally the formal consultation for a biological opinion. But just know that 135 days includes 30 days to ensure that your application or our application for the, the BO is complete. Um, for informal consultations, that's usually 30 days. But again, we need to ensure that we're providing ample time as a cushion to, to meet those. Um, those timeframes. For cultural, dealing with the State Historic Preservation Officer um, or the Caltrans Cultural Studies Office here in headquarters, there's uh, informal consultation with the CSO and there's formal consultation with the, uh, with the, the SHPO. Um, SHPO has technically 30 days for eligibility determinations and 30 days for findings of effect that are uh, sent through SHPO for review. Um, the CSO, the Cultural Studies Office, has a 15-day review period. Um, if you have, if, if you know that something's going to the State Historic Preservation Office and you haven't heard anything back from your planner here in Caltrans, say by the 25th day, you need to make a call and see if it's on schedule to be, to be received. What generally happens is we will provide consultation documents with the resource agencies and we have to keep them on their toes to make sure that they're meeting their deadlines. Um, and a lot of times if they have questions on the quality of a document or there's something that's not um, included um, appropriately, um, you know, the clock might start over again. So just remember those timeframes. If we're dealing in a situation where we're having adverse effects on a cultural resource, um, there is no time frame specified in the law for that. And I've had uh, memorandums of agreement or programmatic agreements that have taken, you know, two or more years to get through the process. I've had some done as, in as little as six weeks. So it just depends on that level of documentation required. Um, we do have to consult with Federal Highway Administration for air conformity on higher level documents. And that takes that can take a little bit of time getting through the interagency consultation process. Um, they generally get back to us quickly. If there's any problems, we just need to talk to our quality staffs or our other partners out there. And then Caltrans can deal, and you know, local agencies can deal with. There's 108 state and federal laws that are um, that are uh, administered by 30 state and federal agencies. And at any time on any project, you could have one of these other agencies. Uh, you could have Coast Guard on a, on a um, bridge replacement. Um, we could deal with State Lands Commission. We could deal with you know, any number, uh, Bureau of Land Management, 
Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, there's many agencies out there that, that your project could be um, required to consult with. And each one of those agencies has varying um, timeframes for their review as well. So just some things to consider when you're talking, when you're um, drawing out your schedules. Back to some challenges, um, your scope. You know, this is, this, this can be difficult, but you know, avoid scope where change where, where possible, but really communicate those changes as, as soon as possible. This is at any time during the process. Um, a lot of times our projects come to us at about 30% um, design. Um, you know, we, the, the more information that we know, the better. Uh, what happens a lot of times is during the NEPA process, we're, we're unsure of, you know, how much, how much dirt's going to be moved or, um, you know, sometimes we're, we're unsure of what type of bridge is going to be built. And then a lot of those questions are moved to the design phase. At Caltrans, we generally have about 60% of rework to do in higher level projects because we didn't have the best information available. You know, we, we judged our, our process on the best of available information, but then as we designed the project, um, things changed. You know, sometimes it's unavoidable, but where it happens, we, we need to know as soon as possible so we can adjust. And this, this will uh, affect your revalidation of, of your documents, which could most of the time require no additional studies, but sometimes we, we may have to go back and, and um, do some additional work. Your tech studies, um, this, is, this is really important. Um, there was a question in the, the Q&A earlier about what to do when a, you know, when a consultant uh, takes a, too much time or um, overanalyzes. These are things that need, these are um, things that need to be brought to Caltrans attention so we can help you through that. Uh, you know, there is a difference between the requirements for CEQA and NEPA, but you can use CEQA to help inform your decision on the NEPA side. And you may have done work early on that can help us get to a decision for NEPA. So we're not required to review your CEQA documentation, but I know when I was a delivery senior back in the District 6 Fresno, I always asked for the CEQA document and studies just so that would give us a baseline on, on what to do uh, with NEPA. So you can utilize that information that you you've received from your CEQA side um, and help inform us on the. So uh, Caltrans has been working on efficiencies for the process. We get a lot of complaints about how long it takes to get an environmental document done, how much time we take to review. Um, over the last two years, we've come up with a few um, process refinements. Uh, we're trying to reduce uh, re redundant documentation uh, we've changed our revalidation process. We've changed requirements for a species list for the Endangered Species Act. Um, and I can discuss those. I try to update the um, RTPA group, you know, during the meetings that we have, but we are um, constantly reviewing our processes just to make sure that we're, we're doing the level best in our review. On the, uh, the NEPA process review is led by our Division of Environmental Analysis. Um, but local assistance is definitely a partner in that process. RBSO or risk-based stewardship and oversight, that's um, improvements that are, we're working with through FHWA. Right now we are looking at a developing a new preliminary environmental study form. Um, we're trying to make it a smarter form. Uh, we do call it the, the smart form, but we'll make it smarter than it is now. We're trying not to make it smarter than ourselves so we can make good decisions, but um, we have some other process improvements that we're looking at too, like changing the PES and take process. And we will be reaching out to our partners as we develop those to get your input. Um, we want to be we want to be good partners and make sure that we're hearing, um, you know, the goods and the bads. You know, Caltrans might take a long time to review a process or or a project or something, but there are some good things that we do too. So. Um, We'll be working with you guys as we go through some of those process uh, reviews. Uh, so here are some training opportunities that you have where we can get into a little bit more in depth. Uh, we've talked about federal aid series uh, previously. Uh, we do it about four times a year. Ours used to be the day two of that. Um, currently, we've, we've done five or six over the last year and a half. 
um, virtually. We hit about uh, 70 people each time. Um, we also have some versions of the Federal Aid Series that we can do as PEZ workshops. Uh, there are several districts out there that can offer that to you. And we can even offer that from the headquarters staff. Uh, we've developed a course in pre-scoping with the PEZ form. And that's where we take the PEZ form. And for those projects that are initially funded with local or state funds only, um, but then you're anticipating federal funds later on in the process, you can use your PEZ form to help you anticipate what studies you may need to, to do as your project is federalized. Uh, Peter did say, you know, if $1 is added to your project with federal funds, um, you will be required to do NEPA. So every project has a story and there might've been a lot of work going on at the local level, uh, you know, to do environmental and then funds fell out of the sky got applied and now a lot of people think we're starting over from scratch, but hopefully if you've anticipated federal funds, you can get to um, at least know what's, what's gonna be expected at that time. We've developed emergency relief uh, training for environmental perspectives. And we also have a course on NEPA revalidations and you can contact me through, there'll be some contact information later on. Um, you can talk to your district uh, contacts and we can help set up any, any additional trainings that you might want for me. And hopefully through this forum, we'll find out some more classes that, that you guys would like to have. So the next few slides are contact information. So here in the Office of uh, Environmental Compliance, I have three seniors that are dedicated to um, uh, work with each four, four districts apiece. Uh, the staff work with um, the districts you can see there. Um, I also have an additional staff person that's not listed here for some reason. Um, sorry, Johnny. Um, he's a data manager and he also deals with section one, delivers section 130 projects and as well as the recreational trails program projects. So we do that here in headquarters for you guys out there. Um, here's contacts for each of the 12 districts. These are senior level staff, senior environmental planners um, or equivalents. Um, so each of the 12 districts has has a senior or equivalent and staff in most of the areas that we deal with biology, cultural, has waste, environmental engineering, um, and other technical specialties here and there too. Um, with that, um, Neil, I I don't know how I'm doing on time there, you but got, you, you're doing great, man. We got a couple minutes um, to field just a few questions in the Q and A. Uh, first one, Kelly. What activities does local assistance do for the NEPA revalidation process? So NEPA revalidation occurs after the environmental document has been completed. So this is going to be in a PSNE in the PSNE right away phase. So or at the next step of the federal process. So as your project moves from environmental to um, well, when you're we say in the next stage of the federal process. Uh, technically, there's supposed to be a revalidation done at the same time your environmental is complete. But what we do is we look at your design plans and we look for consistency on, on the plans to make sure that it's consistent with the documentation that we did for, for um, compliance. Are your mitigation areas um, or monitoring areas, are they included in, you know, environmental commitments, are they included in your design? Um, you know, we look at the contracts that you might have with with monitors um, and just to ensure that that it falls in line with with the commitments we made at the document. Phase. And we will do that as the project proceeds to construction. At the end, um, we there is a closeout process and um, we'll just look to see if, you know, the commitments were completed. That's very good. That's a really uh, important um, reinforcing the point of scoping how important it is making sure you have a really strong handle on your project because as your project changes, as your project limits change, as new elements are added to your project, those do need to go through the NEPA evaluation process. That's what revalidation is for. Um, uh, for the sake of time, I got another one for you here, uh, Kelly. This might be a sequencing one here. Can CEQA expense, such as preparing EIR and other documents be covered by a federal grant? So maybe you can talk about the sequencing of that uh, FHWA will generally not reimburse for the production of the CEQA only document. If you do a joint document that's 
includes both NEPA and CEQA, that work will be re reimbursed. Um, as you're doing that documentation, we'll ask that you follow our annotated outlines and our document templates, but we have little authority to question your CEQA decision making. But um, in a joint document situation, FHWA will reimburse. If you have uh, if you have work that you've done for a categorical exception on the CEQA side, um, that work will not be reimbursed. And likewise for an initial uh, a separate standalone initial study, mitigated neg deck or neg negative declaration, or an environmental impact report, those are generally not reimbursed. Okay, um, last question for environmental. And this one for me, having been both a transportation and now environmental planner is really pretty important. At what point, Kelly, um, in the project, or maybe even before the project, hint, hint, should the PES be submitted prior to preliminary design work, prior to or after CEQA documentation determination is complete? So if you, I said earlier that every project has a story, every project, um, you know, has a life of its own. You may have started a project as a, you know, state or local funded project only without anticipating federal funds, but at some point there's federal dollars applied. Um, as soon as you know there's federal funds applied to your project, that PES form should be done. That PES form should be done before any work is done on the NEPA side. You may have completed a CEQA document, you know, years before, uh, you may be relying on a planning level document to cover your CEQA or, or, or whatever. But as soon as you realize that federal funds are applied, you should be filling out a PES form. Now, saying that, if you can anticipate that federal funds may be applied um, at a future date, but they're, you, know, you have nothing in the FTIP at the time, that is a discussion that you should have with your DLAE and the staff in the districts, because federal level studies can be started at risk with uh, the risk being if, if the project never gets listed in the FTIP, you'll be doing that on your own. But we can pre-scope a project to anticipate what studies may be required. And that goes back to the training opportunity that we had. Neil and I gave a class to LA Metro last year on using uh, with Michael down in District 7, um, using the PES form to anticipate what, what may be required at a later date. Uh, and that's the, the, earlier, the earlier, the better. And, and that's the only thing I would add. It's a, it's a bit of a twofer um, in my experience. Now the PES is a part of the preliminary design process, right? So you do preliminary design, fill out the PES in conjunction. Once you get federal funding, that's the formal NEPA approval process. Once you have a federal aid project number, you begin the process, okay? You submit the PES with the preliminary engineering or preliminary design work that you have available and the project moves through um, delivery um, and, and so forth. But don't forget planning. You can in fact use the PES as an early scoping tool during the planning process. As you're getting ready to go out and write your grant applications, um, as you, if you are an RTPA or an MPO um, partner, don't forget you have the ability to provide your local agency members with technical assistance that can involve using the PES as a planning tool. Take a look at, you know, how sensitive are the environmental resources around your project? What kind of issues are you going to likely run into? Because that can uh, influence the cost and the schedule of your project that you put into your grant applications, that you put into your, your preliminary, um, you know, delivery dates and, and so forth for once you get that federal funding and you begin that federal, um, that formal federal process. So the PES can be used as a planning tool. Um, the last question that we have in Q&A, uh, I'm going to punt over to D for a, a note on adjournment. Um, the question is, what is RBSO? D, that might be a great point uh, for you to leave us on as we look ahead to potential future sessions of this training day and uh, all the great stuff that we're doing behind the scenes that we might like to share. Um, before we get there, though, let's go ahead and ra uh, wrap it up with our second of the two round robins. Um, Sherry, if you can pull that up. Again, um, at this point in the day, um, it's been a long day. We're all super tired. Um, and yet we really want to hear from you in terms of how we can improve um, for the future. Do you want more detail? Do you need more time? Would you like to have um, individual um, sessions like a conference where we, there are different tracks for different disciplines? Whatever that input might be, we hope to improve this experience for you 
and need to hear from you now. Cherry? Great, well, I put the instructions to get back into Menti in the chat again. You see, quite a few of you are on your way back in. There's gonna be three more quick questions we're gonna go through. So the first, if you found this training helpful and would like to, us to hold it again, how often would you like to see it? And thank you again to everybody who's participating. This really does help us refine these, um, these kinds of uh, venues and, and improve as we move forward. Great. And while we're working on these uh, mentees, Tracy has uh, gone ahead and put the link to our larger course evaluation into the chat for us. So if you wouldn't uh, mind clicking on that link before you sign off to, to complete our course evaluation, we would appreciate that. Very good. It's interesting to see answers begin to group together. Um, Sherry, let's go to the next question. How can we improve this training for the future? Some very good input here, as you might imagine, quite the challenge to fit as many topics as we would like to cover, as we heard from you in our initial planning surveys um, into a relatively brief uh, window of time. Again, as we begin to digest the input that you're sharing with us, please don't forget the Federal Aid Series and our other trainings that provide a much deeper dive um, into all of the various subjects that we covered today. Several of the items that we went in today in 10 minutes, we spent hours on in some of those larger and more in-depth courses. And point well taken on diagrams, timelines, flowcharts, and visual graphics. Uh, those are kind. Those are the kinds of aids and leave behinds that, frankly, help folks like you um, retain a lot of the th stuff that we've shared um, as easy at a glance resources. Acronyms, also a really great point, especially for anybody new into the industry. I believe there was a request in the chat as well for an acronym list. Mm -hmm. So we can add that to the list of resources that we provide. That's interesting, some, some comments on um, more frequent Q&A. And a couple um, comments in here about having separate tracks or focus sessions, um, maybe delving a little bit deeper um, into some of the details related to the various subjects we covered today. Um, keep virtual, um, great comment there. We had honestly no idea that we would get the kind of interest that we got today. Um, 
Sherry, let's save a little time for, um, for Dee to provide an adjournment message if she would like and go to our next question. So our last question is just a yes or no. Should future trainings include project delivery best practices from local and region, regional agencies? Blue is yes, pink is no. Very good. It looks like as those yeses roll in, um, we can just simply reiterate that there are great solutions out there. And one of the things that we hope to do is facilitate that peer sharing. Whether you're a local agency, a regional agency, or a consultant that's been working with local assistance project process for a long time, we want to hear from you. Um, if you haven't already, um, and you, and if you, if you do have some great examples that you'd like to share and you haven't already, please put your contact information in the chat so we can go ahead and get a hold of you um, and explore that potential. Um, before we turn it over to Dee for an adjournment message, if, she, if she'd like, um, just to reiterate the importance of filling out the formal course evaluation in the link provided by Tracy in the chat. Again, that really helps there's um, more nuanced questions. It does not take long. We really appreciate you to provide some more detailed input on that matter. I'd like to thank Sac State for pulling this off. I'd like to thank all of our instructors for doing such a great job in such a challenging environment. And we'd like to thank you all for joining us, for engaging, participating, and giving us some great feedback for future refinement. Thank you. You've all helped make this a success. Dee, is there any final note you'd like to provide? I think you guys did an excellent job. Um, I might get a stall here, but thanks again for joining. Um, as you drop off, definitely fill out the, the, um, the survey or the evaluation. It'll definitely help us with ideas for the next training. A lot of great comments, focus training, peer, you know, peer pre uh, presentations that would, that would be very, very helpful. So it isn't always hearing from our local assistance program, but then we also get a chance to hear from you. So, very, my gosh, very well executed. Thanks, thanks again. Um, I'll keep it short and simple, simple but uh, I think you guys have covered so much. We'll see you soon for the next session. Neil, you're, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Dee. Um, I just wanted to, uh, Dawn had to drop off for something else, but she wanted me to share with you this encouragement. This is a partnership. Um, and if you see as local and regional agencies opportunities to improve, please, please, please bring those solutions to the table, right? Wanna make sure this is a two-way conversation and your great ideas, just like refining this, this uh, training is gonna help us all improve the local assistance process in general. So thank you, thank you, Dee. Thank you, instructors. Thank you, Sac State. And thank you for everybody for joining. We'll follow up with uh, a copy of the chat, the Q&A, presentations, and a link to the recording of today's event. We greatly appreciate you joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your afternoon. We look forward to you joining us in another training soon. Bye-bye. You did a great job, Neil, moderating. <laughs> Thank you. You guys made it uh, easy for me. I really appreciate all you instructors. Great job.